Phantom by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 106. Shota, unfazed, deliberately took in the length of Nietzsche's pink nightdress. Richard expected a smirk. Instead, a hot look flashed in Shota's eyes. You have been sleeping in his bed. She sounded almost surprised by her own words, as if the information had come to mind unexpectedly. Nietzsche shrugged with satisfaction at Shota's ire. So I have. The slightest smile in turn curled the corners of Shota's mouth. But you have not succeeded in bedding him yet. Her smile widened. Have you tried, my dear? Or do you fear the sting of rejection? I don't know. Why don't you tell me how it felt? Then I'll decide. Richard gently pulled Nietzsche back from the edge of the step before the two women did something stupid like try to scratch out each other's eyes or reduce each other to ashes. You said you were here for a reason, Shota. This had better not be it. Shota heaved a soft sigh. I found your friend, Chase. He was gravely injured. So you said. How was he injured? Shota's gaze didn't shrink from his. He was hurt by a sword you would be quite familiar with. Richard blinked in astonishment. Chase was hurt by the sword of truth? Samuel attacked Chase? I'm afraid so. Zed shook a bony finger at Shota. This is your doing. Nonsense. Shota, too, lifted a finger as Zed stepped closer, but in warning rather than accusation. The gesture and her words kept Zed from taking another step. I need no sword to accomplish harm. She arched an eyebrow. Like to see, wizard? Stop it, Richard descended the steps two at a time and put himself between Shota and his grandfather. He turned a glare of his own on Shota. What's going on? She sighed unhappily. I'm afraid that I don't entirely know. You gave Samuel my sword. Richard tried to keep the heat out of his voice, to keep from letting his anger show, but he feared that it wasn't working very well. I warned you about his nature. Despite my warning, you insisted that he have it. I want to know what he is up to. Where is Chase? How badly is he hurt? And where is Rachel? Shota's brow twitched. Rachel? The girl with him. The girl he adopted. The two of them were on their way back to Westland. Chase was going to bring his family back to the keep. You mean to say that the girl wasn't there with him? I found him gravely injured. For the first time, Shota looked disconcerted. There was no girl with him. As he watched Rika take the reins to the two horses and pull them toward the paddock, Richard tried to imagine what was going on why Rachel hadn't stayed with Chase. He worried about the possible reasons, worried for what might have happened to Rachel. Knowing how resourceful and devoted she was, Richard wondered if she had gone for help and was now wandering around all by herself. Another thought struck him. And how was it that you just happened to come across Chase? Shota wet her lips. She looked reluctant to say something obviously distasteful to her, but finally she did. I was hunting Samuel. Surprised, Richard glanced at Nietzsche. Her expression showed no reaction, and her features appeared so absolutely devoid of emotion that for an instant it reminded Richard of a similar look he had from time to time seen on Kalen. A confessor's face, she had called it. Confessor's would occasionally shed all emotion in order to do the terrible things that were at times necessary. How is Chase? Richard asked, considerably quieter. He wanted to know why Shota was hunting Samuel, but at the moment there were more important worries weighing on his mind. Is he going to be all right? I believe so, Shota said. He'd been run through with a sword. With my sword? 
Shota didn't argue the distinction. I'm not a healer, but I do have certain abilities, and I was able to at least reverse his journey toward death. I found some people who could care for him and help him recover. I believe he is safe for the time being. It will be a while before he is on his feet again. And why didn't Samuel kill him? Kara asked from the top step. He stabbed Tovey the same way, Nietzsche said. He didn't kill her either. Samuel is certainly capable of murder, Richard pointed out. Shota clasped her hands before herself. Samuel apparently couldn't muster the courage to kill with the sword. He has done so in the past, when the sword was his before. And so he knows the pain it causes when it is used to kill. She arched an eyebrow at Richard. I'm sure you know well what I'm talking about. It's a weapon that does not belong in the wrong hands, Richard said. Shota ignored Richard's jibe and went on. His is the way of a coward. A coward will often leave the person to die on their own, away from his sight. They suffer all the more that way, Zed pointed out. It's more cruel. Perhaps that was his reason. The witch woman shook his head. Samuel is a coward and an opportunist. His goal is not cruelty, but rather is entirely self-centered. Cowards don't necessarily think things out. They act on whim. They want what they want when they want it. Samuel will rarely bother to consider the consequences of his actions. He simply snatches something when he sees an opportunity, when he sees something he desires. He shrinks from the pain it would cause him to kill with the sword, and so he fails to complete the killing he initiated on impulse. If the person he injures suffers an agonizing and prolonged end, it doesn't matter to Samuel because he isn't around to witness it. Out of sight, out of mind. That was what he did to Chase. And you gave him the sword, Richard said, unable to disguise his anger. You knew what he was like, and you still made it possible for him to do this. Shota regarded him a moment before answering. That's not the way it was, Richard. I gave him the sword because I thought it would make him content. I believed that he would be satisfied to have it back in his possession. I thought it would mellow his lingering resentment at having the sword so abruptly taken from him. Shota cast a brief but murderous look at Zed. So you didn't consider the consequences of your actions, Richard said. You simply wanted what you wanted when you wanted it. Shota's gaze slid back to Richard. After all this time and everything that has happened, you are still as flippant as ever? Richard wasn't in a mood to apologize. I'm afraid that there is more to this, Shota said, somewhat less heatedly, more than I realized at the time. Zed rubbed his chin as he considered the situation. Samuel must have stabbed Chase and then kidnapped Rachel. Richard was surprised by Zed's suggestion. He hadn't thought of that. He had assumed that Rachel had gone to find help. He turned a frown on Shota. Why would Samuel do such a thing? I'm afraid that I don't have any idea. Shota looked up at Nietzsche, still standing at the top of the granite steps. Who is this woman you say he stabbed? This Tovey? She was a sister of the dark, and it is no idle accusation. Tovey didn't know the person who stabbed her, didn't know who Samuel was. But she certainly knew the Sword of Truth. She was once one of Richard's teachers back at the Palace of the Prophets. Just before she died, she told me how she and three other Sisters of the Dark had ignited a chain fire spell around Kalin to make everyone forget her. They then used Kalin to steal the boxes of Orden from the People's Palace. Shota's brow creased. She looked truly perplexed. The boxes of Orden are in play, Richard added. Shota flicked a hand dismissively as she stared off in thought. That much I have come to know, but I did not know how it came to be. 
Richard wondered how much more of the story she knew, but he told it anyway. Tovi was taking one of the boxes of Orden away from the People's Palace in Dahara when Samuel jumped her, ran her through with the sword, and then stole the box she was carrying. Shota again looked surprised, but the look was quickly banished by quiet fury as she silently considered what she'd been told. I've known Chase my whole life, Richard said. While anyone can make a mistake, I've never known him to be caught off guard by someone lying in wait. I can't imagine that Sisters of the Dark are much easier to ambush. Gifted people of their level of talent and ability have a sense of people being around them. Shota looked up at him. Your point? Samuel was somehow able to surprise a Sister of the Dark and a Boundary Warden. Richard folded his arms across his chest. What's more, every time Samuel tries to accomplish something evil, you always act all surprised and disavow any knowledge of what he was up to. What's your part in all this, Shota? None. I had no idea of what he was up to. Unlike you to be so ignorant. Her cheeks mantled. You don't know the half of it. She finally turned away from him and headed for the steps. I told you, we have much to talk about. Richard caught her arm, turning her back. Did you have anything to do with Samuel being able to sneak up on Chase or surprise Tovey and steal that box? Other than providing him with the weapon to accomplish the deed and no doubt telling him all about the power the boxes of Orden contain, I mean. She searched his eyes for a time. Do you wish to kill me, Richard? kill you. Shota, I've been the best friend you've ever had. Then you will put your anger aside and listen to what we have come to tell you. She pulled away from the grip on her arm and again started for the steps. Let's get inside and out of this foul weather. Richard glanced to the blue sky. The weather is beautiful, he said as he watched her ascend the steps. At the top, she halted to share a brief glare with Nietzsche before turning to look down at Richard. It was the kind of haunting, timeless, troubling look that he imagined only a witch woman could conjure. Not in my world, she said in a near whisper. In my world, it's raining. Chapter 11 Shota glided down the steps to stand before the fountain. The diaphanous fabric of the dress that covered her statuesque form moved ever so slightly, as if in a gentle breeze. The gushing, cascading, effervescent waters danced and sparkled in the light from the skylights far above, putting on an exhilarating performance for the gathered audience. Shota stared absently at it for a moment, as if preoccupied with her own private thoughts, and then turned to the small crowd, waiting just inside the huge double doors, they all stood silently, watching her, as if awaiting a queen's pronouncement. Behind Shota, the water in the fountain sprayed high into the air. The exuberant surge of spray abruptly stopped. The last of the water, still rising just before the flow had cut off, reached its zenith, a dying liquid arc, and fell back as if slain the dozens of uniform streams of water overflowing the downturned points in the tiers of bowls, as if embarrassed by their frothy frolic, slowed to a stop, and finally fell silent. Zed stepped to the brink of the steps, a forbidding look settling into the lines of his face. As he halted, the swirl of his simple robes gathered around his legs, at that moment, it struck Richard that his grandfather looked very much like who he was, the first wizard. If Richard had thought that Nietzsche and Shota had looked dangerous, he realized that Zed was no less so. At that moment, he was a thundercloud harboring hidden lightning. I'll not have you tampering with anything in this place. I indulge you because you have come here for reasons that may somehow be important to us all, but my leniency will not tolerate your meddling with anything here. 
Shota flicked a hand, dismissing his warning. I assumed that you would not acquiesce to me going any farther than this room. The fountain is noisy. I don't want Richard to fail to hear anything I or Jebra has to say. She lifted an arm toward Anne, standing beside Nathan, watching. Almost unseen in the deep shadows of the balcony and soaring red pillars. It is a matter that has been close to your heart for half of your life, prelate. I am no longer prelate, Anne said in a quietly commanding voice that sounded very much as if she still were. Why were you hunting Samuel? Kara asked, drawing the witch woman's attention. Because he was not supposed to have left my valley in Agaden Reach. Moreover, he should not have been able to do so without my expressed permission. And yet he did, Richard said. Shota nodded. So I went looking for him. Richard clasped his hands behind his back. How is it, Shota, that you weren't aware that Samuel was going to leave you? I mean, considering your power vast knowledge, and all that business you've explained to me about how a witch woman can see the way that events flow forward in time. For that matter, how was he able to do so without your consent? Shota did not shrink from the question. There is only one way. Richard bit back the sarcastic remark that came to mind and instead asked, And what would that be? Samuel has been bewitched. Richard wasn't sure that he'd heard her correctly. Bewitched? But you're the witch woman. You're the one who does the bewitching. Shota clasped her hands, looking down at the floor a moment as she folded her fingers together. He was bewitched by another. Richard descended the five steps. Another witch woman? Yes. Richard took a deep breath as he glanced around to see the others sharing troubled looks. No one appeared inclined to ask, so he did. You mean to say that there is another witch woman around, and she bewitched Samuel away from you? I thought that I had made that perfectly clear. Well, where is she? I have no idea. Certain issues in the flow of time are my business. I have seen to it. For me to be this blind to events that eddy so tightly through my purview can only mean that another witch woman has deliberately occulted those flows from me. Richard stuffed his hands in his back pockets as he tried to reason it out. He paced briefly before turning back to her. Maybe it wasn't a witch woman. Maybe it was a sister of the dark or someone like that. A gifted person. Maybe even a wizard. Jagang has those, too. To manipulate a witch woman in an insignificant way is far from an easy task. She shot a brief glare up at Zed. Ask your grandfather. Shota gestured around at some of the people in the room before her gaze returned to Richard. A gifted person, even such as these, no matter how talented, could not begin to achieve a deception as comprehensive as this one has been. Only another witch woman could slip herself unseen into my domain. Only another witch woman could draw a shroud over my vision and then bewitch Samuel into doing what he has done. If your vision is shrouded, Kara asked, how can you be so certain that Samuel has been bewitched? Maybe he was acting on his own. From what I've seen of him, he needs no mysterious enchantress to coax him into impulsive behavior. He seemed plenty treacherous all on his own. Shota slowly shook her head. You have only to look at what you've told me to see that this involves not simply cunning, but knowledge beyond Samuel's ability. A sister of the dark was attacked. A box of Orden was stolen from her. In the first place, how would Samuel be aware that this woman had anything valuable? I didn't know of her myself, because that is part of what has been hidden from me, so I couldn't have told him, not even absently, carelessly, or inadvertently, which is what you're thinking. 
so, Samuel didn't learn it from me. If he happened across a treasure of some sort, there is no doubt that Samuel is fully capable of doing whatever he could to snatch it. That much I concede. You mean the way he acquired the sword of truth in the first place? Zed asked. Shota met his gaze briefly, but chose to return to the matter at hand rather than confront the challenge. Secondly, how would Samuel know where he could find a sister carrying a box of Orden? You can't seriously mean to suggest that you think he simply was wandering around way off in Dahara and by chance happened across this very sister of the dark, stabbed her and robbed her of what she was carrying, only to have it turn out to be one of the boxes of Orden? I have to admit, Richard said, I never have much believed in coincidence. It certainly doesn't seem plausible in this case either. My thoughts exactly, Shota said. And then there's Chase. Due to his grave condition, I wasn't able to learn much from him, but I was able to discover that he had been ambushed. Another coincidence. Samuel happening across and randomly attacking someone, and it just happens to be someone else you know? I hardly think so. That leaves the question of why Samuel would be lying in wait for a man you know. Why would he attack him? What thing of value did Chase have? Rachel, Zed answered as he stared off, rubbing his chin in thought. But what would he want with a girl? Kara asked. When several people glanced her way with troubled looks, she added, I mean that girl in particular. I don't know, Shota said, and that's the problem. As I've said, the events surrounding all of this are blocked to me but blocked in a way that I didn't recognize, so I was unaware that anything was being hidden. It's obvious that there is a hand directing Samuel. That hand could only be another witch woman's. Do you know her? Richard asked. Do you know who it is, or who she might be? Shota regarded him with as forbidding a look as he had ever seen grace such feminine features. She is a complete mystery to me. Where did she come from? Do you have any idea about that much of it? Shota's scowl only darkened. Oh, I think I do. I believe she came up from the old world. When you destroyed the Great Barrier several years back, she no doubt saw an opportunity and moved into my territory, in much the same way that the Imperial Order saw an opportunity to invade and conquer the new world. By bewitching Samuel, she is sending a message that she is taking my place, taking what is mine, including my territory, as her own. Richard turned toward Anne off at the side of the anteroom. Do you know of a witch woman in the old world? I ran the palace of the prophets, guiding young wizards and a whole palace full of sisters toward the way of the light. I paid great heed to prophecy in that task, but other than prophecy, I didn't really involve myself in the goings-on in the rest of the old world. From time to time I heard vague rumors of witch women, but nothing more than rumors. If she was real, she never stuck her head up for me to know of her. I never knew anything of a witch woman either, Nathan added with a sigh. I never even heard the rumors of such a woman. Shota folded her arms. We're a rather secretive lot. Richard wished he knew more about such things, although knowing one witch woman had proven on more than one occasion to be trouble enough. It seemed that there might now be twice the trouble. Her name is Six, Nietzsche said into the quiet anteroom. Everyone turned to stare at her. Shota's brow drew down. What did you say? The witch woman down in the old world, her name is Six, like the number. Nietzsche's expression had that cool absence of emotion again, her features as still as a woodland pond at dawn after the first hard freeze of the season. I never met her, but the Sisters of the Dark spoke of her in hushed tones. It would be those sisters, 
Anne grumbled. Shota's arms slowly dropped to her sides as she took a step away from the fountain toward where Nietzsche stood on the expanse of marble floor at the top of the steps. What do you know of her? Nothing much. I've only heard her name, Six. I only remember it because it was unusual. Some of my superiors at the time, my sisters of the dark superiors, apparently did know her. I heard her name mentioned several times. Shota's countenance had turned as dark and dangerous as that of a viper with its fangs bared. What were sisters of the dark doing with a witch woman? I don't really know, Nietzsche said. They may have had dealings with her, but if they did, I never knew about it. I wasn't always included in their schemes. It may be that they only knew of her. It's possible they never even met her. Or it's possible that they knew her well. Nietzsche shrugged. Maybe. You'd have to ask them. I suggest you hurry. Samuel has already killed one of them. Shota ignored the taunt and turned away to stare into the still waters of the fountain. You must have heard them say something about her. Nothing very specific, Nietzsche said. Well, Shota said with exaggerated patience, as she turned back around, what was the general nature of what they were saying about her? I only got sense of two things. I heard that the witch, Six, lived far to the south. The sisters mentioned that she lived much deeper down in the old world, in some of the trackless forests and swampland. Nietzsche gazed resolutely into Shota's eyes. And they were afraid of her. Shota folded her arms across her breasts again. Afraid of her, she repeated in a flat tone. Terrified. Shota appraised Nietzsche's eyes for a time before finally yet again turning to stare into the fountain as if hoping to see some secret revealed in the placid waters. There's nothing to say that it's the same woman, Richard said. There's no evidence to say that it's this witch woman six from the old world. Shota glanced back over her shoulder. You of all people suggest that it's mere coincidence? Her gaze again sought solace in the waters. It doesn't really matter if it is or not. It matters only that it is a witch woman, and she is bent on causing me trouble. Richard stepped closer to Shota. I find it pretty hard to believe that this other witch woman would have bewitched Samuel away from you just to show up and have what's yours. There has to be more to it. Maybe it's a challenge, Kara said. Maybe she is daring you to come out and fight. That would require her to make herself known, Shota said. She has done just the opposite. She is deliberate and calculating about remaining concealed, so that I can't fight her. As he considered, Richard rested a boot on the marble bench surrounding the fountain. I still say there has to be something more to this. Having Samuel steal one of the boxes of Orden has darker implications. The more likely answer points to none other than your own hand, Shota. Zed's words drew everyone's attention. This sounds more like one of your grand deceptions. I can understand why you would think so. But if that were true, then why would I come here to tell you of it? Zed's glare didn't falter. To make yourself look innocent when you are really the one in the shadows directing events. Shota rolled her eyes. I don't have time for such childish games, wizard. I have not been directing Samuel's hand. My time has been spent on other, more important matters. Such as? I have been to Galia. Galia? Zed snorted his disbelief. What business would you have in Galea? Jebra laid a hand on Zed's shoulder. She came to rescue me. I was an Ebenissia, caught up in the invasion, and then enslaved. Shota pulled me out of the middle of it. 
Zed turned a suspicious look on Shota. You went to the crown city of Galea to rescue Jebra. Shota glanced briefly at Richard, a clouded look laden with meaning. It was necessary. Why? Zed pressed. I'm relieved to have Jebra at last rescued from that horror, of course. But what exactly do you mean when you say that it was necessary? Shota caught a diaphanous point of the material making up her dress as it lifted ever so gently upward, like a cat arching its back, carving a gentle stroke from its mistress's hand. Events march onward toward a grim conclusion. If the course of those events does not change, then we will be doomed to the rule of the invaders, bound to the mandate of people whose conviction among other things, is that magic is an evil corruption that must be eradicated from the world. They believe that mankind is a sinful and corrupt being who should properly be unremarkable and helpless in the face of the almighty spectacle of nature. Those of us who possess magic, precisely because we are not unremarkable and helpless, will all be hunted down and destroyed. Shota's gaze passed among those watching her. But that is merely our personal tragedy, not the true scourge of the order. If the course of events does not change, then the monstrous beliefs that the order imposes will settle like a burial shroud over the entire world. There will be no safe place, no refuge. An iron mandate of conformity will be locked around the necks of all those left alive. For the delusion of the common welfare, in the form of lofty slogans and vacuous notions, that incite the feckless rabble into nothing more than a mindless lust for the unearned, everything good and noble will be sacrificed, deadening civilized man into little more than an organized mob of looters. But once everything of value is plundered, what will be left of their lives? By their contempt for the magnificent and disdain of all that is good, they embrace the petty and the crude. By their rabid hatred for any man who excels, the beliefs of the order will doom all men to grubbing in the muck to survive. The unwavering view of mankind's inherent wickedness will be the collective faith. That belief enforced through ruthless brutality and unspeakable hardship, will be their enduring high-water mark. Their legacy will be mankind's descent into a dark age of suffering and misery from which it may never again emerge. That is the terror of the order. Not death, but life under their beliefs. Shota's words cast a pall over the room. The dead, after all, can't feel, can't suffer. Only the living can. Shota turned to the shadows where Nathan stood. And what say you, prophet? Does prophecy say it otherwise, or do I speak the truth? Nathan, tall and grim, answered quietly. As far as the imperial order goes, I am afraid that prophecy can offer no testimony to the contrary. You have aptly and succinctly described several thousand years of forewarning. Such ancient works are not easily understood, Anne cut in. The written word can be quite ambiguous. Prophecy is not a subject for the inexperienced. To the untrained it can seem... I sincerely hope that is a judgment based on a shallow opinion of my looks, prelate, and not my talent. I was only... Anne began... Shota dismissively flicked a hand as she turned away. Her gaze settled on Richard, as if he were the only one in the room. She spoke as if addressing him alone. Our lives may be the last lives lived free. This may very well be the end for all time of the best of what can be, of striving for values, of the potential for each of us to rise up and achieve something better. If the course of events does not change, 
then we are now witnessing the dawn of the worst of what can be, of an age where, lest anyone dare live better through their own effort and for their own ends, mankind will be reduced to living the order's idealized lives of ignorant savages. We all know that, Richard said, hands fisted at his sides. Don't you understand how hard we've been fighting to prevent that very thing? Don't you have any idea of the struggle we've all endured? Just what do you think I've been fighting for? I don't know, Richard. You claim to be committed, and yet you have failed to change the course of events, failed to stem the tide of the Imperial Order. You say that you understand, yet still the invaders come, subjugating more and more people with every passing day. But even that is not what this is about. It is about the future, and in the future you are failing us. Richard could hardly believe what he was hearing. He wasn't just angry, but appalled that Chota would say such a thing. It was as if everything he had done, every sacrifice he had made, every effort was meaningless to her, not only now, but in the future. You have come to tell me your prophecy that I will fail? No. I have come to tell you that the way it now stands, unless you change things, we will all fail in this fight. Shota turned from Richard and lifted an arm up toward Nietzsche. You have shown him the dull, numb death that is all that can result from the beliefs held by the Order. You have shown him the bleak existence that is all there is under their dogma, that life's only value is in how much of it you sacrifice, that your life's only purpose is a means to an otherworldly end, a lifeless eternity in the next world. In that, you have done us all a great service, and you have our gratitude. You have truly fulfilled your role as Richard's teacher, even if it was not in the way you had expected. But that, too, is only a part of it. Richard didn't see how his captivity, being made to live a harsh life down in the old world, could be regarded as a service. He hadn't needed to live through it to understand the hopeless futility of life under the rule of the imperial order. He didn't dispute one word Shota had said about what would befall them if they didn't prevail, but he was angered that she seemed to think he needed to hear it again, as if he did not grasp what they were fighting for and as a result was failing to be fully committed to their cause. Richard didn't know how it happened, because he had not seen her move, but Shota was suddenly right before him, her face mere inches from his. And yet, you are still not cognizant of the totality of it, still not resolved in a way that is essential. Richard glared at her. Not resolved? What are you talking about? I needed to find a way to make you understand, Seeker, to make you see the reality of it. I needed to find a way to make you see what is in store for the people of not just the new world, but the old world as well. What is in store for all of mankind? How could you possibly think that I... You are the one, Richard Rahl. You are the one who leads the last of the forces that resist the ideas that fuel the conflagration that is the imperial order. For whatever reasons, you are the one who leads us in this struggle. You may believe in what you fight for, but you are not doing what is necessary to change the course of the war, or else what I see in the flow of events forward in time would not be as it is. As it now stands, we are doomed. You need to hear what is going to be the fate of your people, the fate of all people. So I went to Galia to find Jebra, so that she could tell you what she has seen, so that a seer can help you to see. Richard thought that maybe he should have been angry at the lecture, but he could no longer summon anger. It was slipping away. I already know what will happen if we fail, Shota. I already know what the Imperial Order is like. I already know what awaits us if we lose in this struggle. Shota shook her head. 
you know what it is like after. You know what it is like to see the dead. But the dead can no longer feel. The dead can't scream. The dead can't cry in terror. The dead can't beg for mercy. You know what it is like to see the wreckage the morning after the storm. You need to hear from one who was there when the storm broke. You need to hear what it was like when the legions came. You need to hear the reality of what it will be like for everyone. You need to know what will happen to those alive if you fail to do what only you can do. Richard glanced up at Jebra. Zed's comforting arm encircled her shoulders. Tears ran down her ashen face. She trembled from head to toe. Dear spirits, Richard whispered, how can you be so cruel as to think for an instant that I don't already know the truth of our fate should we lose? I see the flow of the future in this, Shota said in a quiet voice meant for him alone. And what I see is that you have not done enough to change what will be, or else it would not be as I see it. It is as simple as that. There is no cruelty involved simply truth. Just what is it you expect me to do, Shota? I don't know, Richard. But whatever it is, you are not doing it. Now are you? As we all slide into unimaginable horror, you are doing nothing to stop it. You are instead chasing phantoms. Chapter 12 Richard wanted to tell Shota a thousand things. He wanted to tell her that the Imperial Order was hardly the only threat bearing down on them. He wanted to tell her that with the boxes of Orden in play, if not stopped, the Sisters of the Dark would unleash power that would destroy the world of life and give everyone over to the Keeper of the Dead. He wanted to tell her that if they didn't find a way to reverse the chain fire spell, it could very well reap the destruction of everyone's memories and minds, robbing them of their means of survival. He wanted to tell her that if they didn't find a way to purge the world of the contamination left by the chimes, then all magic would be extinguished, and that contamination could very well have already engendered a cascade effect that, if not halted, had the potential all by itself to destroy all life. He wanted to tell her that she didn't know the first thing about the woman he loved, the woman so dear to him. He wanted to tell her how much Kalin meant to him, how afraid he was for her, how much he missed her, how his dread of what was being done to her kept him from being able to sleep. He wanted to tell her that right then the Imperial Order was only one of their dire problems. But seeing Jebra standing there trembling under the comforting shelter of Zed's arm, he thought that there would be a better time to bring up all of those other matters. Richard held out a hand, beckoning Jebra to come forward. Her sky-blue eyes brimmed with tears. She finally, hesitantly, descended the steps toward him. He didn't know the specifics of the frightening things she had been through, but the strain of them was written all too clearly on her gaunt face. The lines there bore silent testimony to the hardships she had endured. When she took his hand, he gently covered it with his other in a small gesture of reassurance. You've traveled a great distance, and we value your help in our efforts. Please tell us what you know. Her short, sandy hair fell forward around her tear-stained face as she nodded. I will do my best, Lord Rahl. Under Shota's watchful eye, Richard led Jebra across the floor toward the fountain. He had her sit on the short marble wall containing the stilled water. You went with Queen Cyrilla back to her home, he prompted. You were taking care of her because she was sick, driven insane by her time in the pit with all those terrible men. You were to help her to recover if she could and advise her if she did. Jebra nodded. So, when she returned to her home, did she begin to get better? Richard asked, even though he knew that much of it from Kalin. Yes. She was in a stupor for so long that we thought she would never get better. 
but after she was home for a while, she finally did start to come round. At first, she was only aware of those around her for brief periods. The more she recognized familiar surroundings, though, the longer those periods of clarity grew. Slowly, to everyone's joy, she seemed to come back to life. She eventually emerged from her long lethargy, like an animal coming out of hibernation. She seemed to shake off her long sleep and return to normal. She was full of energy, full of excitement to be home again. Queen Cyrilla was the Queen of Galia, Shota said to Richard. She inherited the crown rather than Prince Harold, Richard finished, as he looked up at the witch woman. Cyrilla's brother was Harold. Harold declined the crown, preferring to lead the Galean army. Shota arched an eyebrow. You seem to know a lot about the monarchy of Galia. Their father was King Wyborn, Richard said. King Wyborn was also Kalin's father. Kalin is half-sister to Cyrilla. That is the reason I know so much about the monarchy of Galia. If Shota was surprised to hear it, or if she didn't believe him because Kalin was involved, she didn't betray either. She finally broke eye contact with him and went back to her pacing, allowing Jebra to continue her story. Cyrilla resumed her place on the throne as if she had never left. The city seemed exhilarated to have her back. Galia had been struggling in its recovery from the horrifying time that the advance army of the Imperial Order had sacked the Crown City. That attack had been a massive tragedy with tremendous loss of life. But with those invaders long gone, the repairs of the destruction had been underway for quite some time. Even the burned buildings were being rebuilt. Businesses had started up again. Commerce had returned. People once again came to the city from all over Galia to make a better life for themselves. Families had begun to grow and knit together again. With hard work, prosperity had begun to return. With the queen back, it seemed to invigorate the spirit of the city all the more and make the world seem right again. People said that lessons had been learned and such a tragedy would never happen again. To that end, new defenses were built, along with a much larger army. Cyrilla, like many of the people of Galia, put that appalling time behind her and was eager to be about the business of her land. She accepted audiences and kept her hand in many of the matters of state. She kept herself immersed in every sort of activity, from mediating trade disputes to attending formal balls where she danced with dignitaries. Prince Harold, being the head of the Galean army, kept her informed of the latest news about the invasion of the New World, so she was fully aware that the Horde was pouring into the southern reaches of the Midlands. I always knew when she had received the latest reports. I would find her twisting her handkerchief, mumbling to herself, as she paced in a dark room without windows. It almost seemed to me that she was seeking the dark hiding place in her mind, the stupor she had been in before. But she couldn't find it, couldn't get back into it. Jebra gestured briefly up the steps to the old man watching her speak. Zed told me to watch over her, to give her what advice I could. Even though she may have outwardly appeared to be her old self and she didn't lapse back into the wooden days I could tell that she remained on the edge of insanity. My visions were unclear, probably because of that, because while she may have seemed normal again, she was still inwardly haunted by terrible fears. It was much like the land of Galia. Things appeared normal, but with the imperial order in the new world, things were hardly normal. There was always a dark, underlying tension. When we heard from the scouts that the Order was moving up the Calisidron Valley, coming up the center of the Midlands, intent on dividing the New World, I advised the Queen that she must support the Daharan army, that she must send the Galean army to fight with the rest of the forces of all the lands that had been joined together with the Daharan Empire. I tried to tell her, as did Prince Harold, that our only chance at a real defense was in unity with the forces resisting the order. She would not hear of it. She said that it was her duty as the Queen of Galia to protect Galia alone, not other peoples or other lands. 
I tried to make her see that if Galea stood alone, then it stood no chance. Cyrilla, though, had heard stories of other places that had been invaded, stories of the Order's ruthless brutality. She was terrified of the men of the Order. I told her that she would be safe only if we helped stop the invaders before they ever reached Galea. We received desperate requests for troops. Ignoring those requests, Cyrilla instead commanded Prince Harold to gather all the men he could into arms and that he use the army to protect Galea. He said that his duty, that the duty of the Galean army, was to Galea alone. She commanded that the invaders not be allowed to cross the borders, not be allowed to set foot on Galean soil. Prince Harold, who at first had tried to advise her of the wisest course of action, abandoned his own advice, and in an act of pointless loyalty acceded to her wishes. He commanded that the defenses be set up to protect Galea at all costs. Prince Harold went to see to her instructions. She didn't care if the rest of the Midlands, or the entire New World for that matter, fell to the order. As long as the Galean army... Yes, yes, Shota impatiently rolled a hand as she paced before the woman. We all know that Queen Cyrilla was loony. I didn't bring you all this way to describe life under a batty queen. Sorry. Ill at ease, Jebra cleared her throat and went on. Well, Cyrilla grew impatient with me, with my insistent advice. She told me that her decision was final. With her determined commitment to a course of action, it finally fixed events, fixed our future and our fate. I think that for this reason I was at last beset with a powerful vision. It started not with the actual vision itself, but with a blood-curdling sound that filled my mind. That terrible sound set me to trembling. With the frightening sound the visions came flooding forth, visions of the defenders being crushed and overrun, visions of the city falling, visions of Queen Cyrilla being given to the howling gangs of men to be, to be used as a whore and an object of amusement. One hand held across her abdomen, her elbows tight against her sides, Jebra wiped tears back off one cheek. She briefly smiled up at Richard, a self-conscious smile that could not hold back the horror he could so clearly see in her eyes. Of course, she said, I'm not telling you all of the terrible things I saw in that vision. But I told her. I don't expect that it did any good, Richard said. No, it didn't. Jebra fidgeted with a strand of her hair. Cyrilla was enraged. She summoned her royal guard. When they all rushed in through those double, tall, blue, and gilt doors, she thrust a finger at me and proclaimed me a traitor. She ordered me thrown into a dungeon. The queen screamed orders to the guards as they were seizing me that if I spoke even one word of my visions, my blasphemy, as she called it, then they were to cut out my tongue. A little laugh rattled out, a laugh incongruous with her trembling chin and wrinkled brow. Her words came out in a thin whine of apology. I didn't want my tongue cut out. Zed, having made his way down the steps, laid a reassuring hand on the back of her shoulder. Of course not, my dear, of course not. At that point it would have done you no good to have pressed the issue. No one would expect you to go beyond what you did. It would have served no purpose. You did your best. You showed her the truth. She made the conscious choice to be blind to it. Fussing with her fingers, Jebra nodded. I guess that her insanity never really left her. Those who are far from insane often act in an irrational manner. Don't excuse such conscious and deliberate actions with so convenient an explanation as insanity. When she gave him a puzzled look, Zed opened his hands in a gesture of pained frustration at an old dilemma he had seen all too often. All sorts of people who strongly want to believe in something are frequently unwilling to see the truth no matter how obvious it is. They make that choice. 
I guess so, Jebra said. Seems like, rather than heed the truth, she instead believed a lie that she wanted to believe, Richard said, remembering part of the wizard's first rule, the rule he had learned from his grandfather. That's right, Zed swept an arm out in a grim parody of a wizard granting a wish. She decided what she wished to happen and then assumed that reality would bend to her wishes. His arm dropped. Reality doesn't indulge wishes. So Queen Cyrilla was angry with Jebra for speaking the truth aloud, for bringing it out where it could not be so easily overlooked and ignored, Kara said, and then punished her for doing so. Zed nodded as his fingertips gently rubbed Jebra's shoulder. Her tired eyes had closed under his touch. People who, for whatever reason, don't want to see the truth can be acutely hostile to it and shrill in their denunciation of it. They frequently turn their venomous antagonism on whoever dares point out that truth. That hardly makes the truth vanish, Richard said. Zed shrugged with the straightforward simplicity he saw in it. To those seeking the truth, it's a matter of simple, rational self-interest to always keep reality in view. Truth is rooted in reality, after all, not the imagination. Richard rested the heel of his hand on the hickory handle of the knife at his belt. He missed the sword being at hand, but he had traded it for information that eventually led him to the chain fire book and the truth of what had happened to Kalin, so it had been worth it. Still, he sorely missed the sword and worried over what Samuel might be using it for. Thinking of the sword of truth, wondering where it was, Richard stared off at nothing in particular. Seems hard to fathom how people can turn away from seeing what is in their own best interest. Doesn't it, though? Zed's voice had changed from a tone of casual conversation to that thin, reedy tone that told Richard there was something more on his mind. Therein lies the heart of it. When Richard looked his way, Zed's gaze focused intently on him. Willfully turning aside from the truth is treason to one's self. Shota, arms folded, paused in her pacing to lean toward Zed. A wizard's rule, wizard? Zed arched an eyebrow. The tenth, actually. Shota turned a meaningful look on Richard. Wise advice. After holding him in the grip of that iron gaze for an uncomfortably long time, she went back to her pacing. Richard imagined that she thought he was ignoring the truth, the truth of the invading army of the Imperial Order. He wasn't in the least bit ignoring the truth, he just didn't know what more she expected he could do to stop them. If wishes worked, he would already long ago have banished them back to the old world. If he only knew what to do to stop them, he would do it, but he didn't. It was bad enough to know the horror that approached and feel helpless to stop it, but it infuriated him that Shota seemed to think he was simply being obstinate in not doing something about it, as if the solution was within his grasp. He glanced up the steps at the statuesque woman watching him. Even in a pink nightdress, she looked noble and wise. While Richard had been raised by people who encouraged him to deal with things the way they really were, he had been indoctrinated by people who were driven by the beliefs taught by the order. It took a remarkable individual, after a lifetime of authoritarian teachings, to be willing to see the truth. He gazed into her blue eyes for a long moment, wondering if he would have had her courage, the courage to grasp the nature and magnitude of the terrible mistakes she had made, the courage to then embrace the truth and change. Very few people had that kind of courage. Richard wondered if she, too, thought that he was neglecting the invasion of the Imperial Order for irrational and selfish reasons. He wondered if she, too, thought that he was not doing something vital that would save innocent people from horrific suffering. He dearly hoped not. There were times when Nietzsche's support seemed like the only thing that gave him the strength to go on. 
He wondered if she expected him to give up trying to find Kalin in order to turn his full attention to trying to save a great many more lives than just that one, no matter how precious. Richard swallowed back the anguish. He knew that Kalin herself would have made that demand. As much as she had loved him, back when she remembered who she was, Kalin would not have wanted him to come after her if it meant that he would have to do so at the expense of trying to save so many more people who were in mortal danger. The thought he had just had suddenly struck home. Back when she knew who she was, who he was, Kalin couldn't love him anymore if she didn't know who she was, if she didn't know who he was. His knees went weak. That's the way I saw it, Jebra said, opening her eyes and seeming to come awake as Zed withdrew his comforting touch. That I had done my best to show her the truth. But I didn't like being in that dungeon. Didn't like it one bit. So what happened then? Zed scratched the hollow of his cheek. How long were you down in the dungeon? I lost track of the days. There were no windows, so after a time I didn't even know if it was day or night. I didn't know when the seasons changed, but I knew that I had been there long enough for them to come and go. I began to lose hope. They fed me, never enough to be satisfied, but well enough to keep me alive. Every once in a great while they left a candle burning in the dingy central room beyond the iron door. The guards weren't deliberately cruel to me, but it was terrifying being locked away in the darkness of that tiny stone room. I knew better than to complain. When the other prisoners cursed or complained or raised a ruckus, they were warned to be silent. And on occasion, when a prisoner didn't follow those orders, I could hear the guards carrying out their threats. Sometimes the prisoners were there only a short time before being taken to their execution. From time to time, new men were brought in. From what I could see as I peeked out the tiny window, the men they brought in were a violent and dangerous lot. Their vile oaths in the pitch black sometimes woke me and gave me nightmares when I fell back to sleep. The whole time, I waited in dread of having a vision that would reveal to me my final fate. But such a vision never came. I hardly needed a vision, though, to know what the future held. I knew that as the invaders drew close, Cyrilla would likely come to think of it as my fault. I've had visions my whole life. People who don't like the things that happened to them often blame me for having told them what I saw. Rather than use that information to do something about it, it's easier for them to take out their displeasure on me. They often believed that I had caused their troubles by telling them what I had seen, as if what I saw was by my choice and brought to be through malice on my part. Being locked away in that dark cell was almost beyond endurance, but I could do nothing other than endure it. As I sat there endlessly, I could understand how being thrown in the pit had driven Cyrilla mad, at least I didn't have the brutes to contend with. Those kind of men were locked in the other cells. As it was, I thought that I would surely die there, forsaken and forgotten. I lost track of how long I had been locked away from the world, from the light, from living. All the while I never had any more visions. I didn't know at the time that I would never have another. Once... The queen sent an emissary to ask if I would recant my vision. I told the man who came to see me that I would happily tell the queen any lie she wished to hear if she would only let me out. It must not have been what the queen wanted to hear because I never saw the emissary again and no one came to release me. Richard glanced over to see Shota watching him. He could read in her eyes her silent accusation that he was doing that very thing, wanting her to tell him something other than what she saw was in store for the world. He felt a stab of guilt. Jebra gazed up at the skylights high overhead as if soaking up the simple wonder of light. 
one night, I only later learned that up in the world it was night as well, a guard came to the tiny window in the iron door to my cramped little room. He whispered that Imperial Order troops approached the city. He told me that the battle was at last about to begin. He sounded almost cheered that the agony of waiting was finally over, that the reality of it relieved them all of having to pretend otherwise for their queen. It was as if knowing the truth of what was coming somehow made them faithless traitors, but that treason against the queen's wishes would now be transferred to reality. Still, that was only part of the queen's delusions, the part that was too obvious to avoid. I whispered back that I feared for the inhabitants of the city. He scoffed, said that I was daft, that I had not seen Galean soldiers fight. He professed confidence that the Galean army, a force of well in excess of 100,000 good men, would trounce the invaders and send them packing, just as the queen had said. I kept silent. I dared not contradict the queen's wishful illusions of their invincibility, dared not say that I knew that the massive numbers of Imperial Order troops I had seen in my vision would easily crush the defending army and that the city would fall. Locked in my cell as I was, I could not even run. And then I heard that strange, sinister sound from my vision. It ran shivers up my spine. My skin went cold with goosebumps. At last I knew what it was. It was the wail of thousands of enemy battle horns. It sounded like the howl of demons come up from the underworld to devour the living. Not even the thick stone walls could keep out that terrible piercing sound. It was a sound announcing the approach of death, a sound that would have made the keeper himself grin. Chapter 13 Jebra rubbed her shoulders, as if the mere memory of the shrill call of the battle horns had again given her goosebumps. She took a deep breath to regain her composure before she looked up at Richard and went on with her story. The guards all ran to the city's defenses, leaving the dungeon unguarded. Of course, the iron doors they locked behind themselves were more than enough to prevent anyone from escaping. After they were gone, some of the prisoners let out cheers for the approaching imperial order, for the imminent fall of Galia, for what they believed would be their impending liberation. But soon they too went quiet, as cries and screams swelled in the distance above us. Silence settled into the dark dungeons of the palace. Soon I began to hear the clash of arms, the collective cries of men in mortal combat, coming closer all the time, along with the yells that were the awful shrieks of the injured. The shouts of soldiers grew louder as the defenders were driven back, and then the enemy was in the palace. I'd lived in the palace for a time, and I'd come to know so many of those people up there who were about to face. Jebra paused to wipe tears from her cheeks. Sorry, she mumbled as she pulled a handkerchief from her sleeve and dabbed at her nose before clearing her throat and going on. I don't know how long the battle raged, but there came a time when I heard the booming sound of a battering ram bashing against the iron doors above each blow rang through the stone walls. When one door fell, the sounds came closer as the next door then came under assault until it too was breached. And then dozens of soldiers, all shouting battle cries, suddenly spilled down the stairs and into the dungeon. They brought torches with them, filling the room outside my cell with harsh light. They were probably looking for a treasure room, for plunder. Instead, they found a filthy place of empty seclusion. They all rushed back up the stairs and left us to the dark, to quiet, heart-pounding fear. I thought that that was the last I would see of them, 
but it wasn't long before the soldiers returned. This time they brought screaming women back with them, some of the palace staff. Apparently the soldiers wanted to be alone with their fresh prizes, wanted to be away from all the other men who might steal them away or fight them for such valuable living plunder. The things I heard drove me to push myself back into the farthest corner of my cell, but that was no real withdrawal. I could still hear all of the ghastly business. I could not imagine the kind of men who would laugh and cheer at such terrible deeds as they were doing. Those poor women, they had no one at all to help them, and no hope of rescue. One of the younger women apparently broke from the man holding her and in a wild panic ran for the stairs. I heard the voices yelling out for the others to grab her. She was quick and strong, but the men easily caught her and threw her to the floor. When I heard her begging for her life, crying, Please, no, please, no, I recognized her voice. While one man held her down, another put a boot on her knee and lifted her foot until I heard her knee pop. As she screamed in pain and terror, he did the same to the other leg. The men laughed, telling her that now that she wouldn't be running away again, she could put her mind to her new duties, and then they started in on her. I have never in my life heard such frightful screams. I don't know how many men came down into the dungeon, but more and more arrived in turn. It went on for hour after hour. Some of the women wept and wailed the whole time they were being assaulted. Such carrying on brought great gales of laughter from the men, but these were not men. They were monsters without conscience or restraint. One of the soldiers found a stash of keys and went around unlocking the cell doors. He laughed and hooted as he threw open the doors, declaring the liberation of the oppressed and invited the prisoners to get in line to have their revenge on the wicked people who had persecuted and oppressed them. The girl whose knees they'd broken, Elizabeth was her name, had never oppressed anyone in her young life. She'd always smiled as she went about her work because she was so happy to have employment at the palace and because she was infatuated with a young carpenter's apprentice who worked there as well. The prisoners poured out of their cells only too eager to join in. Why didn't they pull you out? Richard asked. Jebra paused for a gulp of air before continuing. When my cell door was thrown open, I pressed myself up into the darkest corner in the back. There was no question as to what would happen to me if I went out, or if I was discovered. What with the screams of the women, the hollering, the laughter of the soldiers, and the scuffling over places in line, the men somehow didn't realize that I was hiding in the darkness at the back of my cell. There wasn't much light down in the dungeon. They must have thought the little room was empty, as some of the others were, for no one bothered to stick a torch in and have a look. After all, the rest of the prisoners were all men, all criminals, and all only too eager to come out. I'd never spoken to them, so they wouldn't have known that there was a woman down in the dungeon with them, or they obviously would have come in after me. Besides, they were all quite preoccupied. Jebra's face, twisted in anguish, sank into her hands. I could not begin to tell you what terrible things were being done to the women only a short distance from me. I will have nightmares about it for the rest of my life. Rape was only part of the purpose of those men. Their real lust was violence, a savage desire to degrade and hurt the helpless, to have the power of life and death over them. When the women stopped struggling, stopped screaming, stopped breathing, the men decided to go find themselves some food and drink to celebrate their victory and then snatch some more women. Like best friends on a holiday, the men all took vows that they would not rest until there was not a woman left in the new world that they had not taken. With both hands, Jebra raked her hair back from her face. After they all rushed off, it fell still and quiet in the dungeon. 
I remained pressed to the back of my cell, the hem of my dress stuffed in my mouth, trying to keep from making a sound that would betray me as I shook and wept uncontrollably. My nostrils were filled with the terrible smell of blood and other things. Funny how after a time your nose has a way of becoming dulled to smells that at first made you sick. Still, I couldn't stop trembling, not after hearing all the ghastly things that had been done to those women. I was terrified that I would be discovered and receive the same treatment. As I hid in the cell, afraid to come out, afraid to make a sound, I could understand how Cyrilla had gone mad under such mistreatment. All the time I could hear the sounds from above, the sounds of battle still raging, the sounds of pain and horror, the screams of the dying. I could smell oily smoke. It seemed like the battle, the killing, would go on forever. The women lying out beyond my open cell door, though, did not make any sound at all. I knew why. I knew that they were beyond any concerns of this world. I prayed that they were now in the tender, comforting arms of the good spirits. I was exhausted from my constant state of fright, but I could not sleep, dared not sleep. The night wore on, and eventually I saw light coming down the stairwell. The iron doors to the dungeon were no longer there to shut out the world above. Still, I dared not go out. I dared not move. I stayed where I was all day until the room fell pitch black again with night. The rampage and looting above continued without abatement. What had begun as a battle had turned into a drunken celebration of victory. Dawn did not bring any quiet from above. I knew that I couldn't remain where I was. The stench of the dead women was becoming unbearable as was the thought of being down there in the dark hole among the rotting corpses of people I knew. Yet such was my fear of what waited above that I stayed where I was that day and then again the entire night. I was so thirsty, so hungry, that I began to see goblets of water on the floor beside loaves of bread. I could smell the warm bread only a few feet away, but when I reached for them, they were not there. I don't remember exactly when it was, but there came a time when I so ached for an end to the constant paralyzing dread that I came to accept and almost welcome my end. I knew all too well what was in store for me, but I reasoned that the agony of my terror would at last be over. So I wanted it to be over. I knew that I would have to endure suffering, humiliation, and pain, but I also knew that, just like the women who lay dead not far from me, it would eventually end, and I would no longer have to suffer. So, I finally dared to step out of the darkness of my cell. The first thing I saw was Elizabeth's dead eyes staring right at me, as if she were looking over, waiting for me to emerge, so that I could see what had been done to her. Her expression seemed a silent plea for me to testify on behalf of justice. But there was no one to testify to, no justice to be had, just my silent witness of her forlorn end. The sight of her, along with the other women, drove me back in. Seeing the nature of the tortures they had been subjected to, I was finally able to connect those atrocities with my memories of their screams. It set me to weeping uncontrollably. I cowered in terror, imagining myself subjected to such things. And then, overwhelmed by a fit of blind panic, I covered my nose with the hem of my dress against the terrible smell and ran through the tangle of twisted naked limbs and bodies. I bolted up the stairs, not knowing what I was running toward, only knowing what I was running from, all the way as I ran, I prayed for the mercy of a quick death. It was a shock to see the palace again. It had been a beautiful place. The painstaking renovations after the previous attack a few years back having only recently been completed. Now it was beyond being a wreck. 
it was impossible for me to understand why men would take the effort to break things the way they had, that they could find joy in such tedious acts of destruction. Grand doors were ripped off their hinges and broken to bits. Marble pillars had been toppled. Parts of shattered furniture lay scattered about. The floors were fairly covered with the litter of pieces of other once grand things, shards of beautifully glazed pottery, fragments of little ears and noses and tiny fingers from porcelain figurines, splintered wooden scraps showing a bit of a once carefully carved and gilded surface, flattened tables, art that had been torn to shreds, or the faces in paintings ground threadbare under heavy boots. The windows were all broken out, drapes pulled down and trampled, statues defaced or broken, walls bashed in in places, covered with blood in others, elaborate rooms defecated in, the feces used to write vile words on the walls along with oaths of death to the order's northern oppressors. Soldiers were everywhere, pawing through the residue left behind by yet other soldiers, picking over the dead, looting anything they could carry off, smashing elegant decorations out of sheer contempt, joking as they stood in lines outside rooms, waiting their turn at the women captives. As I stumbled in a daze through the wreckage of the palace, I kept expecting to be grabbed and dragged off to one of those rooms. I knew that there was no avoiding my fate. I had never seen the likes of these men. These were men who inspired unbridled terror, great, hulking, unwashed men in scarred and blood-stained leather armor. Most of them were covered in chains and belts and studded straps. Many had their heads shaved, making them look all the more muscled and menacing. Others glared out from beneath mats of long, tangled strands of greasy hair. They all looked savage and hardly human. Their faces were blackened with the grimy soot of fires and streaked through with sweat. Their language was loud, coarse, and boldly vile. Seeing such men stalking through the grand pastel pink or blue rooms seemed almost comical, but there was nothing amusing about the bloody axes at their belts, their swords, greasy with gore, or the flails, knives, and iron-spiked cudgels hanging at hand around their waists. But it was their eyes that stopped you in your tracks. All had the kind of eyes that had not just become comfortable with the messy craft of butchery, but had taken a lustful liking to it. All looked upon every living thing they saw with a single evaluation. Is this something to be killed? But their eyes had an even crueler cast when they took in any of the women captives being passed from hand to hand. That look was enough to stop a woman's breath if not her heart. These were men who had abandoned any pretense at civilized manner. They did not bargain or barter the way normal women did. They took whatever they wanted and even fought each other over the most insignificant plunder. They crushed and destroyed and killed on whim without consequence or conscience. They were men beyond the realm of civilized morality. These were savage brutes turned loose among the innocent. Page 138. Chapter 14. If there were soldiers everywhere, then why didn't they snatch you and drag you off? Kara asked, with the kind of casual yet pointed directness that only a moored Sith could so effortlessly muster, as if the very concept of propriety was beyond her. The same question had occurred to Richard, but at that moment, he had not been able to summon his voice. They thought she had been designated as a servant, Nietzsche said in a quiet, knowing voice. Since she was walking around unmolested that long after the onset of the assault, the men would have assumed that there was a good reason, that those in command had reserved her for other duties. Jebra nodded. That's right. An officer who spotted me right off pulled me into a room with other men who were gathered around maps, spread out over tables. The room hadn't been ruined, as had most of the others. 
They demanded to know where their food was, as if I should know. They were just as ferocious looking as the rest of the men, and I would not have known at first that they were the officers, except by the deference paid them by the other soldiers who came and went with reports. Some of these officers were a bit older and had an even harder edge to them, a more calculating look in their eyes than the regular soldiers who always gave them a wide berth. When they looked at me, I knew they were men who expected immediate answers. I grasped at that glimmer of hope that I might live if I played along. I bowed with an apology and told them I would see to the food at once. They said that I had better, apparently more interested in eating than dealing out punishment. I rushed off to the kitchens, trying to act with a sense of purpose while being careful not to run for fear that the men would see a woman running and react like wolves to a fawn bolting from cover. There were several hundred others in the kitchens, mostly older men and women, many of them I recognized as they had long cooked for the palace. There were younger, stronger men there as well who were needed to manage some of the work that was too heavy for the scullions or the elderly, work such as handling the carcasses for butchering or turning the heavy spits. They were all working frantically among the roaring fires and steaming pots as if their lives depended on it, which of course they did. When I entered the kitchens, people hardly noticed me, as they were all rushing about, preoccupied in various tasks. Seeing everyone was already working at a fever pitch, I grabbed up a large platter of meats and offered to take it back up to the men. The people in the kitchens were only too happy to have someone else who was willing to go out among the soldiers. When I returned with the food, the officers who had sent me abandoned what they had been doing. They appeared to be ravenously hungry. They sprang up from the couches and chairs and used their bare, filthy hands to snatch the meat off the tray. As I set the heavy tray on one of the larger tables, one of the men peered up at me as he chewed a mouthful. He asked why I didn't have a ring in my lip. I didn't know what he was talking about. They put rings through the lower lips of slaves, Nietzsche said. It marks them as the property of men of rank and keeps the soldiers from taking them as plunder. It gives those in command servants at their disposal for menial work. Jebra nodded. The officer yelled orders. A man grabbed me and held me while another came forward, he pulled my lower lip out and shoved an iron ring through. Nietzsche stared off into the distance. They use iron as a reference to iron kettles and such. An iron ring signifies kitchen workers and such. Richard saw the glaze of suppressed rage in Nietzsche's blue eyes. She, too, had once worn a ring through her lower lip, although hers had been gold to denote that she was the personal property of Emperor Jagang. It was no honor. Nietzsche had been used for things far worse than menial tasks. You're right about that, Jebra said. After they put the ring in my lip, I was sent back to the kitchens to get them more food and wine. I realized then that the other people in the kitchen wore iron rings as well. I was in a numb daze as I ran back and forth to get the officers what they demanded, I snuck a gulp of water or a mouthful of food whenever I could. It was enough to save me from collapse. I found myself thrown in with other frightened people who worked at the palace who were now taking orders from the officers. I hardly had time to consider how I had by chance managed to escape a worse fate. As much as it throbbed and bled, I was glad to have that iron ring through my lip, because when any soldier saw it, he changed his mind about his intentions and let me be. Before long, I was sent out with heavy satchels of food and drink for officers in other areas of the city. Out in the countryside surrounding the city, I began to discover the true extent of the horror that had befallen Ebenissia. When Jebra sank into a distant daze, Richard asked, What did you see? She looked up at him, as if she had almost forgotten that she was telling her story. But then she swallowed back her anguish and went on. Outside the city walls, there were tens of thousands of dead from the battles. The ground, for as far as the eye could see, was covered with mangled corpses. 
Many bunched in groups where they had died, making their last stand. The sight seemed unreal, but I had already seen it before, in my vision. The worst of it, though, was that there were a number of Galean soldiers still alive, though grievously wounded. They lay here and there on the field of battle beside their dead brethren, wounded and unable to move. Some moaned softly as they lay near death. Others were more alert, but unable to move for one reason or another. One man was trapped, his legs crushed under the weight of a broken wagon. Another had been pinned to the ground by a spear through his gut. Even though in great pain, he wanted so desperately to live that he dared not pull himself off the shaft and release what it held in place. Others had legs or arms so badly broken that they were unable to crawl over the chaos of dead soldiers, horses, and rubble. With soldiers constantly patrolling, I knew that if I stopped to offer any comfort or aid to these wounded men, I would be spotted and killed. As I made my way back and forth from the outposts, I had to pass through this awful battlefield. The hills where this final engagement had taken place were dotted with hundreds of people slowly making their way among the dead, methodically picking through their belongings. I later learned that they were a small army of people who trailed behind the Imperial Order troops, camp followers, living off the scraps that the Order soldiers left in their wake. These human vultures pawed through the dead soldiers' pockets and such, making their living on death and destruction. I recall one older woman in a dingy white shawl coming upon a Galean soldier who was still alive. Among other wounds, his leg had been gashed open to the bone. His hands trembled with the endless, solitary effort of holding the massive wound closed. It seemed a miracle that he was even still alive. As the old woman in the shawl pulled at his clothes, looking for anything valuable, he begged her for a sip of water. She ignored him as she tore open his shirt to see if he had a neck chain with a purse, as some soldiers did. In a weak, hoarse voice, he again pleaded for a sip of water. She instead pulled a long knitting needle from her belt and, as he lay helpless, shoved it in the man's ear. Her tongue poked out of the corner of her mouth with the effort of twisting the long metal needle around inside his brains. His arms flinched and then went still. She drew the length of her knitting needle back out and wiped it off on his pant leg as she muttered a complaint that that would keep him quiet. She replaced her knitting needle in her belt and went back to rifling through his clothes. It struck me how well practiced she had seemed at the grisly task. I saw other camp followers use a rock to bash in the head of any man they found alive, just to be certain he wouldn't surprise them by striking out when they were busy hunting for any loot. Some of these scavengers didn't bother to do anything to the wounded man unless he could still use his hands and tried to fend them off. If he was alive but unable to resist, they merely helped themselves to what they could find and then moved on. But there were people who lifted a fist in the air and shouted in triumph whenever they found a fallen soldier still alive, one they could dispatch, as if doing so made them a hero. Occasionally, there were those who came upon the helpless wounded and enjoyed torturing them in the most ghastly manner, amused by the fact that the men could neither run nor fight them off. It was only a matter of a few more days, though, before all the wounded survivors were dead, either from succumbing to their wounds or finally being dispatched by the camp followers. Over the next few weeks, the Imperial Order soldiers celebrated their great victory with an orgy of violence, rape, and plundering. Every building was broken into and thoroughly searched. Anything of value was looted other than the small numbers of the people like me who had been designated as servants, no male escaped capture and no woman escaped the clutches of those vile men. Jebra wept over her words. No young woman should ever have to endure what was done to those poor creatures. The captured Galean soldiers, as well as the men and boys of the city, 
were well aware of what was happening to their mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters. The order troops saw to that. Several times, small groups of the captives who could no longer bear it rose up to try to stop the abuse. They were slaughtered. Before long, the captives were sent in great gangs to dig seemingly endless pits for the dead. When they had finished digging the pits, they were forced to recover all the rotting bodies for mass burial. Those who resisted ended up in the pits as well. Once all the dead had been collected and thrown into the pits, the men then had to dig long trenches. After that, the executions began. Nearly every male over the age of 15 was to be put to death. There were tens of thousands of people who had been caught up in the order's net. I knew that it would take weeks to butcher them all. The women and the children were forced at sword point to watch their menfolk being put to death and thrown in the great open pits. While they watched, they were informed that this was an example of what happened to those who resisted the just and moral law of the imperial order. They were lectured throughout the endless executions, lectured on how it was blasphemy against the Creator to live as they had been living, solely for their own selfish ends. They were told that mankind had to be purged of such corruption and would be better for it. Some of the men were beheaded. Some were made to kneel before the pits, and then brawny men with iron-capped cudgels walked down the line and with a powerful swing bashed in the heads of each man in turn, while a couple of captives in chains followed behind, throwing each freshly killed man in the trench. Some of the prisoners were used for target practice with arrows or spears. Fellow soldiers laughed and mocked the drunken executioner if his sloppy aim failed to achieve a clean kill. It was a game to them. I think, though, that the great magnitude of the grisly business brought a somber mood over some of the imperial soldiers, and they turned to drinking as a way of masking their revulsion so that they could join in as was expected of them. It's one thing to kill in the heat of combat, after all, but quite another to kill in cold blood. But kill in cold blood they did. As the victims fell into the trenches, they were covered over with dirt by those who would soon join them. I recall one rainy day when I had to bring food to officers standing under the shelter of what once had been a canvas awning over a shop, now held up with lances. They were there to watch an execution that was being put on as an elaborate spectacle. The terrified women who were to witness the death sentences being carried out were brought straight from the rape rooms by their captors. Many of the women were still only half-dressed. By the many sudden cries of recognition and names shouted out, it soon became obvious to me that the order interrogations had identified the husbands of the women and had singled them out. The couples were being brought together in a macabre reunion, separated but in full view of one another. The women, huddled together and helpless, were made to watch as the wrists of their men were tightly bound behind their backs with leather thongs. The men were forced to kneel near the fresh pits facing the women. Soldiers came down the line and in turn held each man's head up by his hair, then sliced open his throat. I remember the executioner's powerful muscles glistening in the rain. Holding their victims by the hair, after cutting his throat, they heaved each body back into the pits before going on to the next man in line. The men waiting to be slain wept and trembled as they cried out the names of their beloved, cried out their undying love. The women did likewise as they watched their men murdered and then thrown in on piles of other men still thrashing and gasping in the throes of death. It was horrific, as wrenchingly sorrowful as anything I have ever seen. As they saw their loved ones killed, many of the women fainted, collapsing to the muddy ground covered in vomit. As the steady rain fell, others in wild terror screamed the names of the man they saw about to be put to death. They struggled against the iron grip of guards who laughed as they dragged the women away in turn, shouting out the details of their intentions to their husband who was about to die. It was a twisted kind of cruelty that inflicted suffering on a scale that I could not begin to adequately convey. 
Families were not only being torn apart forever, but being wiped out. Did you ever hear that old question, how do you think the world will end? This was how. This was the world ending for thousands upon thousands of people. Only it was ending one person at a time. It was one long, drawn-out withering of lives, the final ending of each individual's world. Richard gripped his temples between the thumb and fingers of one hand so hard that he thought he might crush his own skull. With great difficulty, he managed to control his breathing and his voice. Didn't anyone manage to escape? He asked into the ringing silence. During all of these various rapes and executions and all, didn't anyone escape? Jebra nodded. Yes, I believe that a few made it out, but of course I had no real way to know for sure. There were enough who escaped, Nietzsche said in a quiet voice. Enough? Richard shouted as he turned his fury on her. He caught the flash of rage that had slipped through his control and brought his voice back down. Enough for what? Enough for their purpose, Nietzsche said, gazing into his eyes, solemnly enduring what she saw there. The Order knows that there are people who escape. During the height of the brutality, the worst of the horrors, they deliberately relax security so as to be sure that a few at least will escape. Richard's mind felt as if it were hopelessly adrift in a thousand scattered, disheartened thoughts. Why? Nietzsche shared a long look with him before she finally answered. To spread such a fear that it will grip the next city in terror. That terror will ensure that people in the path of the advancing army will surrender rather than face the same brutal treatment. In this way, victory comes without the order having to fight every inch of the way. The terror that is spread by escaping people who tell others what they saw is a powerful weapon that crumbles the courage of those yet to be attacked. With the way his heart was pounding, Jebra could understand the terror of waiting for the order to attack. He raked his fingers back through his hair as he redirected his attention to Jebra. Did they murder all the captives? A few of the men, ones who were deemed not a threat for one reason or another, were sent with other people from the city out into the countryside in gangs to work the farms. I never knew what happened to these people, but I presume they are still there, toiling as slaves to raise food for the order. Jebra's gaze sank as she pulled some strands of hair back from her face. Most of the women who survived became the property of the troops. Some of the younger and more attractive women had a copper ring put through their lower lips and were reserved for the men of rank. Carts frequently prowled the camp, collecting the bodies of women who had died during their abuse. No officer ever raised any objection to the brutal treatment these women received out in the tents among the troops. The dead were taken to the pits and thrown in. No one, not even Imperial Order soldiers who died, were ever buried with their name on a marker. They were all thrown in the mass graves. The Order does not believe in the significance of any individual and does not mark their passing. What of the children? Richard asked. You said that they didn't kill the younger boys. Jebra took a deep breath before she began again. Well, from the very first, the boys had been gathered together and organized by age into groups of what I can only describe as boy recruits. They were regarded not as captured Galeans, not as the conquered, but as young members of the Imperial Order liberated from people who would only have oppressed them and corrupted their minds. The blame for the wickedness that necessitated the invasion was placed on the older generations, not these young people who were said to be innocent of their elders' sins. Thus they were separated physically and spiritually from the adults, and thus was begun their training. The boys were drilled in a manner that was like playing games, grim as it must have been to many. They were treated relatively well and kept occupied every moment in contests of strength and skill. They were not allowed to pine for their families. That was described as showing weakness. 
The order became their families, whether they liked it or not. At night, while I could hear the cries of women, I could also hear the boys as they sang together under the leadership of special training officers. She gestured as an aside. I had to bring these officers food and such, so I had a chance to see what was happening to these boys as the weeks and then the months passed. After training for a time, the boys began to earn rank and standing within their group for a variety of things, whether it be in games of skill and strength or in memorizing their lessons in the righteous ways of the order. As I would rush about in my duties for the officers, I would see the boys standing at attention before their groups reciting back the things they had been taught, speaking of the glory of being part of the order, of their honorable duty to be part of a new world dedicated to the advancement of mankind and of their willingness to sacrifice for that greater good. Even though I never really had the chance to learn the specifics of what these boys were being taught, I remember a line shouted incessantly as they stood at attention, I can be nothing alone. My life has meaning only through dedication to others. Together we all are one, of one mind, for one purpose. After emotionally charged rallies, the boys were brought in their groups to watch executions of traitors to mankind. They were encouraged to cheer when each traitor died. Their order leaders stood proud and tall before the boys, backs to the bloodbath, saying, Be strong, young heroes. This is what happens to the selfish betrayers of mankind. You are mankind's future saviors. You are the future heroes of the order, so be strong. Whatever trepidation the boys may have had at first, under the long and ceaseless indoctrination, guidance, and constant encouragement of the officers, those boys cheered. Even if it was not sincere at first, it seemed to become so in the end. I saw how the boys began to believe with real fervor the things they were being taught by adults. The boys were encouraged to use knives issued to them to stab the freshly killed traitors. This was only one of the ways they were systematically desensitized to death. In the end, the boys were earning rank by participating in the executions. They stood before empty-eyed captives and lectured them on their selfish ways, their treason to their fellow man and the Creator. The boy then condemned that individual captive to death, and on occasion even carried out the deed. Their fellows applauded their zeal for helping to purge mankind of those who had resisted the holy teachings of the order, those who had turned away from their Creator and their divine duty of service to their fellow man. Before it was over, Almost every one of those boys had a hand in the butchering of the captives. They were praised as heroes of the order. At night in their barracks, the few boys who would not go along with participating in the executions became outcasts and were eventually stigmatized as cowards or even sympathizers of the old ways for being selfish and unwilling to support their fellow man, or in this case, boy. They were most often beaten to death by their group. These few boys in my eyes were the heroes. They died alone at the hands of their fellow boys, boys who had once played and laughed with them, but had now become the enemy. I would have given nearly anything to have been able to give these few noble souls at least a hug and a whisper of my thanks that they had not joined in, but I could not, so they died alone as outcasts among former friends. It was madness. It seemed to me that the whole world had gone insane, that nothing made sense anymore, that life itself made no sense anymore. Pain and suffering became the definition of life. There was nothing else. Memories of any kind of joy seemed like dim dreams and no longer real. Life dragged on day after day, season after season, but it was life that revolved around death in one way or another. In the end, the only people of Galea left alive were the boys and the women who didn't die during the brutal rapes and then as whores for the soldiers. In the end, the older boys were participating in the rapes as part of their initiation and as rewards for their enthusiasm during their assignments, including the executions. 
Many of the women, of course, managed to kill themselves. Every morning, on the cobblestone streets at the foot of the taller buildings, were found the broken bodies of women who, seeing no future but degrading abuse, had managed to throw themselves out of windows or off roofs. I don't know how many times I would happen upon a woman off in some dark corner, her wrists slashed by her own hand, her lifeblood having drained away along with any hope. I couldn't say that I blamed them for their choice. Richard stood with his hands clasped behind his back, staring into the still waters of the fountain, as Jebra went on in endless detail of the events following the great victory by the brave men of the Imperial Order. The senselessness of it was almost too monumental to comprehend, much less endure. The slashes of sunlight coming in through the skylights above slowly crept across the marble bench around the pool, across the expanse of floor, up and across the granite steps. The blood-red stone of the columns glowed as the sunlight ceaselessly, incrementally advanced up their length while Jebra chronicled everything she knew of what had happened while she had been a captive of the Order. Shota stood unmoving nearly the entire time, usually with her arms folded, her fair features fixed in a vaguely grim cast, watching Jebra tell her story, or watching Richard listen to it, as if making sure that his attention didn't wander. Galia had reserves of food aplenty for their citizens, Jebra said but not for anything like the numbers of invaders now occupying the city, who themselves did not have plentiful supplies with them. The troops stripped every storehouse of food. They emptied every larder, every warehouse, every animal for miles around, including the great many sheep that were raised for wool, and the milk cows were butchered for food. Rather than keep the chickens for a steady supply of eggs, they too were killed and eaten. As the food ran low, the officers sent off messengers with ever more urgent requests for resupply. For months, the supplies did not come, no doubt in good part because winter had set in and slowed them. Jebra hesitated and then swallowed before going on. I remember the day. It was during a heavy snowstorm when we were ordered to cook some fresh meat the Imperial Order soldiers delivered to the kitchens. It was freshly killed, headless, gutted human carcasses. Richard abruptly turned to stare at Jebra. She gazed up at him as if from a place of insanity, as if in fear that she would be condemned for what she knew was beyond the pale. Her blue eyes brimmed with tears of supplication for forgiveness, as if she feared he would strike her dead for what she was about to confess. Have you ever had to butcher a human body for cooking? We had to. We roasted the meat, or stripped it from the bones to make stews. We dried rack upon rack upon rack of the meat for the regular soldiers. If the soldiers were hungry, and there was nothing to feed them, bodies would be delivered to the kitchens. We went to extraordinary lengths to stretch what supplies of food we had. We made soups and stews with weeds, if we could find them beneath the snow, but there was just not enough food to feed all the men. I witnessed many things that will give me nightmares the rest of my life, seeing those remorseless soldiers standing in the open doorway, the snow blowing in behind them as they dumped those bodies on the floor of the kitchen will be one of the things that forever haunts me. Richard nodded and whispered, I understand. And then... Early this past spring, the supply wagons finally began arriving. They brought great quantities of foodstuffs for the soldiers. I knew, despite the seemingly endless wagons full of supplies, that it would not last a long time. Beside the supplies, there were also reinforcements to replace the men who had been killed in the battle to crush Galia. The numbers of order troops occupying Ebenissia were already overwhelming, the extra soldiers seemed to add to my numb sense of hopelessness. I overheard newly arrived officers reporting that more supplies would be coming, along with yet more men. As they streamed in from the south, many were sent on missions to secure other areas of the Midlands. 
There were other cities to be taken, other places to be captured, other pockets of resistance to be crushed, other people to be enslaved. Along with the supplies and the fresh troops came letters from the people back home in the old world. They were not letters to any specific soldiers, of course, since the imperial order had no way of knowing how to find any individual soldier within their vast armies, nor would they have cared to, since individuals as such were unimportant in their eyes. Rather, they were letters sent to the general delivery of the brave men fighting for the people back home, fighting on behalf of their creator, fighting to defeat the heathens to the north, fighting to bring backward-thinking people the salvation of the order's ways. At night, every night for weeks, the letters that had come with the supply wagons would be read to assembled groups of men, most of whom couldn't read themselves. They were letters of every kind, from people telling of the great sacrifices they had made in order to send food and goods north to their fighting men, to letters extolling the great sacrifices the soldiers were making to advance the divine teaching of the order, to letters from young women promising their bodies in service to brave soldiers when they returned from vanquishing the uncivilized and backward enemy to the north. As you can imagine, this last kind of letter was quite popular, and they were read over and over to hoots and wild cheering. The people of the old world even sent mementos, talismans to bring victory, drawings to decorate the tents of their fighters, cookies and cakes that had long ago rotted, socks, mittens, shirts, and caps, herbs for everything from tea to bandages, scented handkerchiefs from enraptured women eager to offer themselves in duty to the soldiers, weapons belts and such made by the corps of young boys who trained with groups of other boys their own age until the day they could also go north to smite the people who resisted the Creator's wisdom and the Imperial Order's justice. The long trains of supply wagons, before they went back to the old world to get more of the supplies necessary to support the enormous army up in the new world, were loaded down with loot to be taken back to the cities of the old world that were supplying the food and goods needed by the army. It was like a loop of trade. Booty for supplies, supplies for booty. I suppose that seeing endless wagon loads of plundered riches streaming south was also intended to be a great incentive for the people back home to continue to support what has to be the enormous cost of the war effort. The army that had invaded was far too large to fit in the city, of course, and with the reinforcements arriving with each train of supply wagons, the endless sea of tents spread even farther out into the countryside, blanketing the hills and valleys all around. The trees for a goodly distance had all been stripped and used for firewood throughout the previous winter, leaving the landscape around the crown city looking lifeless and dead. The new grasses never grew beneath the teeming masses of men, the countless horses and variety of wagons, so that it seemed that Galia had been turned to a sea of mud. From new units just arrived, men coming up from the old world were formed into strike forces that were sent to attack other places, to spread the rule of the imperial order, to establish dominion. It seemed that there was an endless supply of men to enslave the new world. I was working to exhaustion, feeding all the officers, so I was frequently around the command personnel, and often overheard invasion plans and reports of cities that had fallen, tallies of prisoners taken, accounts of the number of slaves sent back to the old world, on occasion, some of the more attractive women were brought back for the use of the men of rank. The eyes of these women were wild with fear of what was to become of them. I knew that their eyes would soon enough become dull with longing for the release of death. It all seemed to me one endless attack, one long, endless savagery that showed no signs of ever ending. The city by then, of course, had been all but emptied of the people who once had called it home. Almost every male over fifteen had long ago been put to death, and the handful who hadn't had been sent off as slave labor. Many of the women, the ones too old or too young to be of use to the order, had been put to death if they were in the way, but many had simply been left to starve to death. 
They lived like rats in the dark crevices of the city. Last winter I saw droves of old women and little girls who looked like skeletons covered in a pale veneer of flesh begging for scraps of food. It broke my heart, but to feed them would only end an execution for them and for me. Still, if I could get away with it, I sometimes slipped them food if there was any to be had. In the end, it was as if the population of Galia's crown city, hundreds of thousands of people, had for the most part been wiped from existence. What was once the heart of Galia is no more. It is now occupied by soldiers in the hundreds of thousands. The camp followers began setting up homes in the places long since plundered, simply taking over what was someone else's. More people from the old world began to drift up to take places and live in them as their own. The only Galean women left alive were for the most part slaves used by the soldiers as whores. After time many became pregnant and gave birth to children fathered by the soldiers of the imperial order. These offspring are being raised to be future zealots for the order. Virtually the only Galean children left alive after the first year of occupation were the boys. Drilled endlessly in the ways of the order, those boys became the order. They had long since forgotten the ways of their parents or their homeland or even common decency. They were now imperial order recruits, newly minted monsters. After months and months of training, groups of the older boys were sent to be the first wave of attackers against other cities. They were to be the flesh that dulled the swords of the heathens. They went eagerly. I had once thought that the brutes who are the imperial order were a distinctly different, savage breed of people unlike the civilized people of the new world. After seeing how those boys changed and what they became, I realized that the people who are the order are really no different than the rest of us except in their beliefs and the ideas that motivate them. A crazy thought, perhaps. But it seems that through some mysterious mechanism, anyone is susceptible to being beguiled into falling for the order's ways. Jebra shook her head in dismay. I never really understood how such a thing could come about, how the officers could teach boys such dry lessons, how they could lecture them that they must be selfless, that they must live a life of sacrifice for the good of others, and then, as if by magic, those boys would march off merrily singing songs, hoping to die in battle. The premise is pretty simple, really, Nietzsche said offhandedly. Simple? Jebra's brow lifted with incredulity. You can't be serious. Chapter 15 Oh, yes, simple. Nietzsche descended the steps one at a time in a slow, measured manner as she spoke. Both boys and girls in the old world are taught the same thing by the fellowship of order and in the same basic manner. She came to a halt not far from Richard and loosely folded her arms as she sighed, not out of weariness, but rather with a weary cynicism. Except that with them it started not all that long after they're born. It begins with simple lessons, of course, but those lessons are expanded and reinforced over their entire lifetime. It's not unusual to see pious old people sitting through the lectures given by brothers of the Fellowship of Order. Most all people are drawn toward ordered social structure, and they yearn to know how they fit into the larger scheme of the universe. The Fellowship of Order provides them with a comprehensive and authoritative sense of structure, in other words, tells them the right way to think as well as a proper way to live their lives. But it's most effective when started with the young. If a young mind is molded to the order's dogma, then it usually becomes inflexible and fixed for life. As a result, any other way of thinking, the very ability to reason, generally withers and dies at a young age and is lost for life. When such a person is aged, they will still sit through the same basic lessons, still hang on every word. Simple, Jebra asked. You said the premise is pretty simple? Nietzsche nodded. The order teaches that this world, the world of life, 
is finite. Life is fleeting. We are born, we live for a time, and we die. The afterlife, by contrast, is eternal. After all, we all know that people die, but no one ever comes back from the dead. Dead is forever. Therefore, it is the afterlife which is important. Around this core tenet, the Fellowship of Order ceaselessly drums into people the belief that one must earn their eternity in the glory of the Creator's light. This life is the means to earn that eternity, a test in a way. Jebra blinked in disbelief. But still, life is... I don't know, it's life. How can anything be more important than your own life? She softened her skepticism with a smile. Surely that isn't going to convince people to the Order's brutal ways. Convince them to turn away from life. Life. With sudden menace in her glare, Nietzsche leaned down a little toward Jebra. Don't you care about your soul? Don't you think that what happens to your very own soul for all eternity might be of serious and earnest concern to you? Well, of course I... I... Jebra fell mute. As she straightened, Nietzsche shrugged with a mocking, dismissive gesture. This life is finite, transitory. So in the scheme of things, in contrast to an eternal afterlife, how important can a fleeting life in this miserable world be? What true purpose could this brief existence possibly have other than to serve as a trial of the soul? Jebra looked uncomfortably dubious, yet unwilling to challenge Nietzsche when she framed it in such a way. For that reason, Nietzsche said, sacrifice to any suffering, any want, any need of your fellow man is a humble recognition that this life is meaningless. A demonstration that you acknowledge eternity with the Creator in the next world to be the consequential concern, yes? By sacrificing, you are avowing that you do not value man's realm over eternity, the Creator's realm. Therefore, sacrifice is the price, the small price, the pittance, that you pay for your soul's eternal glory. It's your proof to the Creator that you are worthy of that eternity with Him. Richard was amazed to see how easily such a rationale, delivered by Nietzsche with confidence, command, and authority, intimidated Jebra into silence. While listening as Nietzsche towered over her, Jebra had occasionally glanced to the others, to Zed, to Kara, to Shota, even to Anne and Nathan, but seeing none of them offering any objection or counter-arguments, her shoulders began to hunch as if she wished she could disappear into a crack in the marble floor. If you confine your concerns to being happy in this life, Nietzsche casually swept an arm out, indicating the world around her as she glided regally back and forth before them. If you dare to revel in the senseless trivialities of this wretched world, this meaningless brief existence that is a rejection of your all-important eternal next life, and thus a rejection of the Creator's perfect plan for your soul, who are you to question the Creator of all the universe? How dare you put your petty wishes for your insignificant, pathetic little life ahead of his grand purpose of preparing you for all of eternity? Nietzsche paused, folding her arms with a kind of deliberate care that implied a challenge. A lifetime of indoctrination gave her the ability to express the Order's carefully crafted tenets with devastating precision. Seeing her standing there in her pink nightdress somehow only seemed to underscore her derision of the triviality of life. Richard remembered all too well Nietzsche delivering that very same message to him, only at the time she had been deadly serious. Jebra avoided Nietzsche's piercing gaze, instead fixing her stare on her hands nested in her lap. To bring the ways of the order to other people, Galia, for example... Nietzsche said as she resumed her pacing lecture. Many of the Order's soldiers had to die. She shrugged. But that is the ultimate sacrifice, one's life, in an effort to bring enlightenment to those who do not yet know how to follow the only right and true path to glory in the next world. If a person sacrifices their life in the struggle on behalf of the Order to bring salvation to backward, ignorant, and unimportant people, 
then they earn eternity with him in the next world. Nietzsche lifted an arm, sheathed in the satiny pink material of the nightdress, as if to reveal something magnificent but invisible standing right there before them. Death is merely the doorway to that glorious eternity. She let the arm drop. Because an individual life is unimportant in the scheme of things that really matter, it's obvious that by torturing and killing individuals who resist, you are only helping to sway the masses of the unenlightened over to enlightenment. So you are bringing those masses salvation, serving a moral cause, bringing the Creator's children home to his kingdom. Nietzsche's expression turned as grim as her pretense had been. People who are taught this from birth come to believe it with such blind zeal that they see anyone living in any manner other than according to the order's teachings, in other words, failing to pay the rightful price of sacrifice in return for eternal salvation, as deserving of an eternity of unimaginable agony in the dark, cold depths of the Keeper's realm of the underworld which is exactly what awaits them unless they change their ways. Very few people who grow up under this indoctrination have enough of their reasoning ability still intact to be able to think their way out of this bewitching circular trap. Nor do they want to. To them, to rejoice in life, to live for themselves, is trading eternity for a brief and sinful frolic before a looming doom without end. Since they must forego the enjoyment of this life, they are going to be only too quick to notice anyone who fails to sacrifice as they should, fails to live by the canons of the fellowship of order. Besides, recognition of sinfulness in others is deemed a virtue, because it helps to direct those who neglect their moral duty to turn back to the path of salvation. Nietzsche leaned down toward Jebra and lowered her voice to a sinister hiss much the same as killing non-believers is a virtue, yes? Nietzsche straightened. Followers of the order develop an intense hatred for those who do not believe as they do. After all, the order teaches that wicked sinners who refuse to repent are no less than keepers' disciples. Death is no more than such enemies of the righteous deserve. Nietzsche spread her arms in a forbidding gesture. There can be no doubt about any of this, since the Order's teachings are, after all, merely the wishes of the Creator Himself, and thus divinely elicited truth. Jebra was now clearly too cowed to offer an argument. Kara, on the other hand, was clearly not cowed. Oh, really, she said in an even but contrary tone, I'm afraid that there's one fly in the ointment. How do they know all this? I mean, how do they know that the afterlife is really anything at all like they portray it? She clasped her hands behind her back as she shrugged. As far as I know, they haven't visited the world of the dead and then returned. How would they know what it's like beyond the veil? Our world is the world of life, so life is what's important in this world. How dare they demean it by making our only life the price for something unknowable? How can they begin to claim that they know anything at all about the nature of other worlds? I mean, for all anyone really knows, the spirit world could be a mere transitory state as we slip into the non-existence of death. For that matter, how would the fellowship of order know that these are the Creator's wishes, or that He has any wishes at all? Kara's brow drew down. How do they even know that creation was brought about by a conscious mind, in the form of some divine breed of king. Jebra looked relieved that someone else had finally objected. Nietzsche smiled in a curious manner and raised an eyebrow. There's the trick of it. Without looking over, she lifted her arm back toward Anne, standing across the room in the shadows. It's the same method by which the prelate and her sisters of the light know their version of the same gruel to be true. Prophecy or the high priests, or some humble but deeply devout person, has heard the intimate whispers of the divine, or has seen into a sacred vision he has sent them, or has been visited in dreams. 
There are even ancient texts that profess to have infallible knowledge of what is beyond the veil. Such lore is mostly a collection of the same kind of whispers and visions and dreams that in the distant past were set down as fact and have become irrefutable simply because it is old. And how are we to verify the veracity of this testimony? Nietzsche swept her arm out in a grand gesture. Why, to question such things is the greatest sin of all, lack of faith. The very fact that the unknowable is unknowable is what they claim gives faith its virtue and makes it sacrosanct. After all, what would be the virtue in faith if that in which we have faith could be known? A person who can maintain absolute faith without any proof whatsoever must possess profound virtue. As a consequence, only those who take the leap of faith off the bedrock of the tangible into the emptiness of the imperceptible are righteous and worthy of an eternal reward. It's as if you are told to leap from a cliff and have faith that you can fly, but you must not flap your arms because that would only betray a fundamental lack of faith and any lack of faith would infallibly ensure that you would plummet to the ground, thus proving that a failure of faith is a personal flaw and fatal. Nietzsche ran her fingers back into her blonde hair, lifting it off her shoulders, and then with a sigh she let her arms drop. The more difficult the teachings are to believe, the greater the required level of faith. Along with the commitment to a higher level of unquestioning faith comes a tighter bond to those who share that same faith, a greater sense of inclusion in the special group of the enlightened. Believers, because their beliefs are so manifestly mystic, become ever more estranged from the unenlightened, from those who are suspect because they will not embrace faith. The term non-believer becomes a commonly accepted form of condemnation. Demonizing anyone who chooses, Nietzsche tapped a finger to her temple, to stick to the use of reason. Faith itself, you see, is the key. The magic wand that they wave over the bubbling brew they have concocted to render it self-evident. Anne, despite the glare of contempt for a sister of the light turned traitor to the cause, offered no argument. Richard thought it a rare choice on her part, and one that at that moment was particularly wise. There, Nietzsche said, shaking a finger as she paced, barefoot, there is the crack in the order's imposed tower of teachings. There is the fatal flaw at the center of all convictions contrived in the imagination of men. Such things in the end, even though they may be sincere, are nothing more solid than the elaborate product of whimsy and self-deception. In the end, without the rock of reality, an insane person who hears voices in their head is equally sincere and equally credible. That is why the order vaunts the sanctity of faith and teaches that you must dismiss the wicked impulse to use your head, that you must instead abandon yourself to your feelings. Once you surrender your life to blind faith in their account of the afterlife, they claim that then and only then the doorway to eternity will magically open for you, and you will know all. In other words, knowledge is to be gained only through rejection of everything that actually comprises knowledge. This is why the order equates faith with holiness, and why its absence is deemed to be sinful. This is why even questioning faith is heretical. Without faith, you see, everything they teach unravels. And since faith is the indispensable glue that binds together their teetering tower of beliefs, faith eventually gives birth to brutality. Without brutality to enforce it, faith ends up being nothing more than a fanciful daydream, or a queen's empty belief that no one will attack her throne, that no enemy will breach the borders, that no force can overthrow her defenders if she merely forbids it. After all, I don't need to threaten you to get you to see that the water in that fountain is wet or that the walls of this room are constructed from stone. But the order must threaten people to make them believe that an eternity of being dead will be an eternal delight, but only if they do as they're told in this life. 
As she glared into the still waters of the fountain, Richard thought that Nietzsche's blue eyes might turn that water to ice. The cold rage in those eyes was born of things she had seen in her life that he could not begin to imagine. On the dark and quiet evenings alone with her, the things she had been willing to confide in him were terrible enough. It's a lot easier to convince people to die for your cause if you first make them eager to die, Nietzsche said in a bitter voice. It's a lot easier to get boys to bear their breasts to arrows and swords if they have faith that doing so is a selfless act that will make the Creator smile and welcome them into the eternal glory in the afterworld. Once the Order teaches people to be true believers, what they have really done is to forge monsters who will not only die for the cause, but kill for it as well. True believers are consumed by an implacable hatred for those who don't believe. There is no more dangerous, no more vicious, no more brutal an individual than one who has been blinded by the Order's beliefs. Such a believer is not shaped by reason, so he is not bound by it. As a consequence, there is no mechanism of restraint on his hatred. These are killers who will only too happily kill for the cause, absolutely secure in the knowledge they are doing the right and the moral thing. Nietzsche's knuckles stood out white and bloodless as her fists tightened. Though the room seemed to ring with the sudden terrible silence, the power of her words still echoed through Richard's mind. He thought that the strength of the aura crackling around her might provoke a sudden lightning storm within the anteroom. As I said, the premise is pretty simple. Nietzsche shook her head in bitter resignation, the emotion draining from her bleak pronouncement. For most of the people of the old world, and now the people of the new world, there is no choice but to follow the Order's teachings. If their faith wavers, they are sternly reminded of the eternity of unimaginable suffering that awaits the faithless. If that fails to work, then faith will be driven into them by the point of a sword. But there must be some way to redeem these people, Jebber said at last. Isn't there a way to bring them to their senses and get them to cast off the teachings of the Order? Nietzsche looked away from Jebra to stare off into the distance. I was brought up from birth under the Order's teachings, and I came to my senses. Still staring off into a dark storm of memories, she fell silent for a moment, as if she were reliving her seemingly endless struggle to grasp at life, to escape the haunting clutches of the Order. But you cannot imagine how profoundly difficult it was for me to emerge from that realm of dark beliefs. I doubt that anyone who has not been lost in the suffocating world of the Order's teachings can begin to grasp what it's like to believe that your life is worthless and of no value, or grasp the shadow of terror that falls over you every time you try to turn away from what you have been taught is your only means of salvation. Her watery gaze hesitantly drifted to Richard. He knew he had been there. He knew what it was like. I was redeemed, she whispered in a broken voice. But it was far from easy. Jebra looked encouraged by what Richard knew was no real encouragement. But it worked for you, she said, so maybe it will work for others. She is different from most of those under the spell of the order, Richard said, as he gazed into Nietzsche's blue eyes, eyes that betrayed the naked emotion of how much he meant to her. She was driven by a need to understand, to know, if what she had been taught to believe was true, or if there was more to life, if there was something worth living for. Most of those taught by the Order have no such doubts. They block out those kinds of questions and instead tenaciously cling to their beliefs. But what makes you think that they won't change? Jebra didn't look ready to abandon the thread of hope. If Nietzsche changed, then why can't others? Still gazing into Nietzsche's eyes, Richard said, I think they're able to block out any doubt in what they believe because they've eternalized their indoctrination, no longer viewing it as specific ideas that have been drilled into them. 
they begin to experience the ideas they've been taught as feelings, which evolve into powerful emotional conviction. I think that's the trick to the process. They are convinced within their own minds that they are experiencing original thought rather than those discrete ideas that have been taught to them as they grew up. Nietzsche cleared her throat as she looked away from Richard's gaze and turned her attention once more to Jebra. I think Richard is right. I was aware of that very thing within my own thinking, aware of that inner conviction that was actually born of a carefully crafted manner of instruction. Some people who secretly value their lives will join in a revolt if they can see that there is a realistic chance to win. That's what happened in al Turang. But if there isn't that chance, then they know that they must repeat the words that the followers of the order want to hear or risk losing their most valuable possession, life. Under the order's rule, you believe as they teach you or you die. It's as simple as that. There are people in the old world working to join together those who will revolt, working to set the fires of freedom for those who want to seize an opportunity to control their own destiny. So there are those who truly want a chance at freedom and will act to gain it. Jagang, too, knows of such efforts and has sent troops to crush those revolts. But I also know only too well that most of the people of the old world would never willingly cast off their beliefs. They see doing so as sinful. They will work to ruthlessly crush any uprising. If need be, they will cling to their faith right into their graves. The ones... Shota irritably lifted a hand, cutting Nietzsche off. Yes, yes, some will, some won't. Many whiffle waffle. It doesn't matter. Hoping for a revolt is pointless. It's just idle wishing for salvation to arrive out of the blue. The legions of soldiers from the old world are here now in the new world. So it's the new world that we must worry about, not the old world and what the mood for revolt might or might not be. The old world, for the most part, believes in the order, supports the order, and encourages the order to conquer the rest of the world. Shota glided forward, directing a meaningful look at Richard. The only way for civilization to survive is to send the invading soldiers of the order through that doorway to their longed-for eternity in the world of the dead. There is no redeeming those whose minds are lost to beliefs they are eager to die for. The only way to stop the order and their teachings is to kill enough of them so they can't continue. Pain does have a way of changing people's minds, Kara said. Shota gave the Mord Sith a nod of approval. If they come to truly understand, without any doubt, that they will not win, that their efforts will lead to certain death, then perhaps some will abandon their belief and cause. It very well could be that despite their faith in the teachings of the Order, few of them actually, deep down inside, really want to die to test it. But what of it? Does that really matter to us? What we do know is that a great many really are so fanatical that they welcome death. Hundreds of thousands have already died, proving that they really are willing to make that sacrifice. The rest of these men must be killed, or they will kill us all and doom the rest of the world to a long, grinding descent into savagery. That is what we face. That is the reality of it. Chapter 16 Shota turned a hot look on Richard. Jebra has shown you what will happen at the hands of these soldiers if you don't stop them. Do you think those men entertain any rational notions of the meaning of their lives? Or that they might join in a revolt against the order if given a chance? Hardly. I'm here to show you what has already happened to many, so that you will understand what is going to happen to everyone else if you don't do something to stop it. A precise understanding of how the soldiers of the order came to be the choices they have made in their lives that brought them rampaging into the lives of innocent people and the reasons behind those choices are beyond our concern. They are what they are. They are destroyers, 
killers. They are here. That is all that matters now. They must be stopped. If they are dead, they will cease to be a threat. It's as simple as that. Richard wondered how in the world she expected him to accomplish such a simple thing. She might as well be asking him to pull the moon down out of the sky and use it to crush the Imperial Order Army. As if reading his mind, Nietzsche spoke up again. We may all agree with you, with everything you have come here to say, and in fact we didn't need you to tell us what we already know, as if you think us children and only you are wise, but you don't understand what you're asking. The army that Jebra saw, the army that marched up into Galia and so easily crushed their defenses and killed so many people, is a minor and rather insignificant unit of the Imperial Order. You can't be serious, Jebra said. Nietzsche finally withdrew her glare from Shota and looked at Jebra. Did you see any gifted? Gifted? Why, no, I guess not, she said after a moment's thought. That's because they didn't warrant having their own gifted to command, Nietzsche said. If they had gifted, Shota would not have been able to so easily get in there and then take you right out of the place. But they had no gifted. They're a relatively minor force, and as such, they're considered expendable. That's why the supplies took so long to reach them. All supplies first went north to Jigang's main force. Once they had what they needed, they then allowed supplies to go to other units, like the one up in Galia. They are only one of Jigang's expeditionary forces. But you don't understand, Jebra stood. They were a huge army. I was there. I saw them with my own eyes. She dry-washed her hands as she glanced around at everyone in the room. I was there, working for them month after month. I saw how massive their numbers were. How could I not grasp the extent of their forces? I've told you about all they accomplished. Unimpressed, Nietzsche shook her head. They were nothing. Jebra licked her lips, distress settling into her expression. Perhaps I have not done an adequate job of describing it, of making clear just how many soldiers of the Order invaded Galia. I'm sorry that I've failed in making you understand how easily they crushed all those determined defenders. You did a very good job of reporting accurately what you saw, Nietzsche said in a gentler tone as she squeezed the woman's shoulder in sympathetic reassurance. But you only saw a part of the whole picture. The part you saw frightening as it surely was, was insignificant compared to the rest of it. What you saw could not begin to prepare you for seeing the main force led by Emperor Jagang. I've spent a great deal of time in Jagang's main encampments. I know what I'm talking about. Compared to their main force, the one you saw does not qualify as imposing. She is right, Zed said in a grim voice. I hate to admit it, but she's right. Jagang's main army is vastly more powerful than the one that invaded Galia. I fought to slow their advance up through the Midlands as they steadily drove us back toward Aidendrill, so I ought to know. Seeing them come is like watching the approach of uncountable minions of the underworld come to swallow the living. He looked stoic in his simple robes, standing at the top of the five steps, watching listening to what others had to say. Richard knew, though, that his grandfather was anything but indifferent. Zed's way was often to listen to what others had to say before he had his say. In this instance, there was no need for him to correct anything that he'd heard. If the Order troops in Galia have no gifted, Jebra said, then perhaps if some of those with the gift were to go there, you could eliminate them. Perhaps you could save those poor people who are still alive who have endured so much. It is not too late to at least save some of them. Richard thought that what she was really asking, but feared to speak aloud, was if this was only a minor force with no gifted among them, then why hadn't some of those present done something to stop the slaughter she'd witnessed? Before Richard had ever left his woods of Heartland, he might very well have harbored the same vague sense of resentment and anger toward those who had not done anything to save them. 
Now he felt the torment of knowing how much more there was to it. Nietzsche shook her head, dismissing the idea. It's not so feasible as it might seem. The gifted might be able to take out a large number of the enemy and for a time create havoc. But even this expeditionary force has sufficient numbers to withstand any attack by the gifted. Zed, for example, could use wizard's fire to mow down ranks of soldiers. But as he paused to conjure more, the enemy would be sending wave upon wave of men at him. They might lose a lot of men, but they are not deterred by staggering casualties. They would keep coming. They would throw rank after rank of men into the conflagration. Despite how many would die, they would soon enough overwhelm even one as talented as the first wizard. And then where would we be? Even something as simple as a band of archers could take down a gifted person. She glanced at Richard. All it takes is one arrow finding its mark, and a gifted person will die the same as any other. Zed spread his hands in a gesture of frustration. I'm afraid that Nietzsche is right. In the end, the order would be in the same place with the same result, even with fewer men. We, on the other hand, would be without those with the gift that we sent against them. They can replenish their troops with nearly endless reinforcements, but there will be no legions of gifted coming to our aid. As callous as it may seem, our only chance lies not with throwing our lives away in a futile battle that we know has no chance of success, but with being able to come up with something that has a real chance to work. Richard wished that he believed that there was some solution, some plan that had a real chance to work. He didn't think, though, that there was any chance that they could do anything other than prolong the end. Jebra nodded, her glimmer of hope sparking out. The deep creases that lent a sagging look to her face, along with the lasting web of wrinkles at the corners of her blue eyes, made her look older than Richard suspected she really was. Her shoulders were slightly rounded, and her hands rough and calloused from hard labor. Even though the men of the order had not killed her, they had sapped the life out of her, leaving her forever scarred by what she had been through and what she'd been forced to witness. How many others were there, like her, alive but forever withered under the brutality of the occupying forces, hollow shells of their former selves, alive on the outside, but lifeless inside. Richard felt dizzy. He could hardly believe that Shota would bring Jebra all this way to convince him of how terrible the order really was. He already knew the truth of their brutality, of the nature of their threat. He'd lived for nearly a year in the old world under the repression of the order. He had been there at the start of the revolt in al -Turang. Jebra's first-hand testimony, if anything, was only helping to convince him of what he already knew, that they didn't stand a chance against Jagang and the Imperial Order forces. The entire Daharan Empire would probably have been able to stop the unit that had descended upon Galia, but that was nothing compared with the main army of the Imperial Order. Back when he'd first met Kalin, he'd fought hard to stop the threat to everyone brought by Dark and Rawl. As difficult as it had been, Richard had been able to end that threat by eliminating Dark and Rawl. He knew, though, that this threat was different. As much as he hated Jagang, Richard knew that he could not think of this in the same terms as the last battle. Even if he could somehow kill Jagang, that would not stop the menace of the Imperial Order. Their cause was monolithic, ideological, not driven by the ambitions of one individual. That was what made it all seem so hopeless. Shota's vision, what she foresaw in the flow of time as the Order's hopeless future if they failed to do something to stop the Imperial Order, certainly didn't seem to Richard to have required any great talent or special sight. He didn't need to be a prophet to see how dire a threat the Order was. If not stopped, they would rule the world. Jebra, in that sense, had told him nothing new nothing that he didn't already know. Richard recognized all too well that, the way things stood, 
When the forces of the Daharan Empire finally met Jagang's empire in the final battle, those brave men, who were all that stood in the order's way, were all going to die. After that, there would be no opposition to the imperial order. They would rampage unchecked, and in the end, they would rule the world. Shota was far from stupid, so she obviously knew all that, and had to know that he would know it as well. So he wondered, why was she really here? Despite his dark mood over Jebra's frightening account of what she had seen, Richard had to think that Shota very likely had some other reason for her visit. Still, Jebra's story had been difficult to listen to without it stirring not only his anguish, but his anger. Richard turned away and stared into the stilled water of the fountain. He felt the weight of gloom settling around his shoulders. What could he do about any of it? It felt as if this and all the other troubles pressing in around them were pushing Kalin away from his thoughts, away from him. At times she hardly even seemed real to him. He hated it whenever he had such a thought. Sometimes when he remembered her wit or the way she smiled so easily when she rested her wrists on his shoulders and locked her fingers together behind his neck and gazed at him, or her beautiful green eyes or her soft laugh or her touch, or the tight smile she gave no one but him, she seemed more like a phantom who existed solely in his imagination. The very thought of Kalin not being real sent a spike of tingling dread surging up through his insides. He had lived with that numbing fear for a long, dark period. It had been terrifying to be alone in his belief that she existed, terrifying to doubt his own sanity, until he had at last found the truth of the chainfire spell and convinced the others that she was indeed real. Now, at least, he had their help. Richard mentally shook himself. Kalin was no phantom. He had to find a way to get her out of the clutches of Sister Ulyssia and the other two sisters of the dark. It didn't help, though, that the thought of Kalin being a captive of such ruthless women caused him such anguish that he sometimes couldn't bear to think about it to think of what terrible things they might do to the woman who was his world, the woman he loved more than life itself, and yet he could not make his mind focus on anything else. Despite what Shota believed he should do, Richard had to remember that, besides Kalin being lost in the vortex of the chainfire spell, there were other ominous dangers, like the boxes of Orden being in play, and the damage left behind by the chimes. He couldn't ignore everything else just because the witch woman came marching in to tell him what she thought he should do. It could even be that Shota's true goal was some complex scheme, some hidden agenda involving this other witch woman, Six. There was no telling what Shota was really up to. Still, Richard had come to have great respect for her, as had Kalin, even if he didn't entirely trust her. While Shota often seemed to be an instigator of trouble, it was not necessarily because she was deliberately trying to cause him grief. Sometimes her intent was to help him, and at other times she was simply the messenger of truth. And while she was always right in the things she revealed to him, those things almost always turned out to be true in ways Shota hadn't predicted, or at least in ways she hadn't revealed. As Zed often said, a witch woman never told you something you wanted to know without also telling you something you didn't want to know. The first time he met her, Shota had said that Kalin would touch him with her power, and so he should kill her to prevent that from happening. As it turned out, Kalin did use her confessor's touch on him, but that was how he had been able to trick Darken Rahl and defeat him. Shota had been right but it had happened in a manner that turned out to be vastly different from the way she'd presented it. Even though she had been right, strictly speaking, if he had followed her advice, Dark and Rawl would have survived to unleash the power of Orden and rule them all, or the ones left alive. In the back of his mind lurked the prediction Shota had made that if Richard married Kalin, she would bear a child that would be a monster. He and Kalin had been wed, Surely that prediction would not turn out the way Shota had presented it either. 
surely Kalin would not give birth to a monster. It was Zed who finally spoke, bringing Richard out of his private thoughts. Whatever happened to Queen Sorella? The room was dead still for a time before Jebra answered. It was as it had been in my vision. She was handed over to the lowest of the soldiers to use as they wished. They were eager to get at their prize. It went very badly for her. Her worst fears came to pass. Zed cocked his head, apparently believing that there was more to the story. So that was the last you saw of her? Jebra folded her hands before herself. Not exactly. One day, as I was rushing to deliver a platter of freshly roasted beef, I came upon a raucous group of men playing a game that the Imperial Order troops were very fond of watching. There were two teams with the gathered men shouting and yelling them on. The men were all betting on which team would win. I don't know what the game was. Ja la, Nietzsche said. When Jebra turned to look at her, Nietzsche said, The game is called Ja la. In theory, it's a game of athletic ability, skill, and strategy. In practice, under the rules the Order plays it by, Ja la is all of that, and in addition, it's quite brutal. Ja la is Jagang's favorite sport. He has a team of his own. I remember once when they lost a game, the whole team was put to death. Page 169 The Emperor soon had a new team of the most skilled, toughest, most physically imposing players to be found. They did not lose. The full name of the game is Ja La De Jin. In Emperor Jagang's native tongue, it means the game of life. Jebra frowned in recollection. Yes, I guess I do recall hearing it called Ja La. I always saw it played with a heavy ball, a ball heavy enough to, on occasion, break the bones of the players. The ball is called a brock, Richard said without turning. Nietzsche glanced over at him. That's right. Well, Jebra said, resuming her story, on this particular day, as I was taking the platter to the commanders, I had to go to the place where the game was being played. There were thousands of troops gathered to watch. I was directed to a small stand for the commanders and had to make my way through the cheering throngs. It was a terrifying journey. The men saw the iron ring of a slave in my lips, so none dared to pull me away to their tents, but that didn't stop their hands on me. Jebra's gaze sought the floor. It was something that I had to endure often enough. She finally looked up. When I reached the commanders, down close to the playing field, I saw that the men starting up a new game weren't using the ball that they usually used. She cleared her throat. They were using Queen Cyrilla's head for the ball. Jebra sought to fill the uncomfortable silence. Anyway, life in Galia had been changed forever. What was once a center of commerce is now little more than a vast army camp from where continuing campaigns against some of the free areas of the New World are launched. The farms out in the country, run by forced labor, don't produce as they once did. Crops fail or are poor. The needs of the vast armed forces in Galia are huge. Food is always scarce, but the supplies that regularly come up from the Old World keep the soldiers fed well enough to carry on. I worked day and night as a slave to the needs of the Imperial Order commanders. I never again had any visions after the one about Queen Cyrilla. It seemed odd to me to be without my visions. I'd had them my whole life. But after that terrible vision about Queen Cyrilla, a couple of years back, no more came. My gift as a seer seems to have vanished. My vision has gone dark. By the glance from Nietzsche, Richard knew that she suspected what he was thinking. Eventually, Jebra said, I was one day snatched away from the middle of all those troops. It was Shota who somehow got me out. I'm not entirely sure how it happened. I just recall that she was there with me. 
I started to ask something, but she told me to keep my mouth shut and to start walking. I remember turning back once to look, and there was the army spread out across the valley and up into the hills, but they were a great distance behind us. I don't know how it had happened, really, that we were so far away. She frowned into her dim memories. We were just walking, and here I am. I'm afraid, though, that because my visions have gone dark, I can no longer be of any help to you. Richard thought she should know the truth, so he told her. Your vision probably went dark because several years back the chimes were in this world for a time. They were banished back to the underworld, but the damage was done. I think that the presence of the chimes in the world of life began the disintegration of magic. It must be that it disrupted your ability. Your gifted vision is probably lost. Or, even if it returns in part or for a time, it will eventually be completely extinguished. Jebra looked dazed by the news. My whole life I have frequently wished that I had never been born with the vision of a seer. In many ways, it made me an outcast. I often wept at night wishing to be free of my visions, wishing they would leave me be. But now that you tell me that my wish has been granted, I don't think that I ever really meant it. That's the problem with wishes, Zed said as he sighed. They tend to be things that... The chimes? Shota interrupted. By her tone of voice as well as her frown, Richard knew that she wasn't interested in hearing about wishes. If such a thing were true then why has there been no evidence of it? There has been, Richard said with a shrug. Creatures of magic, such as the dragons, have not been seen in the last couple of years. Dragons? Shota coiled a long wavy lock of hair around a finger as she appraised him silently for a moment. Richard, people can go for a lifetime and never catch a glimpse of a dragon. And what of Jebra's visions going dark? After the chimes were in this world, her visions ceased. Like other things of magic, her unique ability is flickering out. I'm sure that we aren't even aware of most of them. I would be aware of them? Not necessarily. Richard raked his hair back off his forehead. The problem is, chain fire, which I heard first about from you is a spell that was ignited by four sisters of the dark to make everyone forget Kalin. That spell is contaminated by the chimes, so besides Kalin, people are forgetting other things as well, such as dragons. Shota looked anything but convinced. I would still be aware of such a thing because of the way they flow forward in time. And what about this other witch woman, Six? I thought that you said that she was masking your ability to see the flow of time. Shota ignored his question and pulled the finger free of the skein of auburn hair. As she folded her arms, her almond-shaped eyes remained fixed on him. If the shadow of the Order darkens mankind, none of it will matter now, will it? They will put an end to all magic as well as all hope. Richard didn't answer. Instead, he turned to the still waters, to his brooding thoughts. Shota tilted her head, gesturing toward the steps as she spoke quietly to Jebra. Go up there and see Zed. I need to talk to Richard. Chapter 17 As Shota glided closer to Richard, she cast Nietzsche a threatening glare and wondered why Shota hadn't also told Nietzsche to go back up the steps with Jebra to talk to Zed. He surmised, though, that the witch woman probably knew that Nietzsche wouldn't follow any such orders. He certainly didn't want to see them in a test of wills. He had had enough to worry about without those on the same side battling among themselves. When Richard glanced over and saw Jebra ascending the steps, he also saw that Anne and Nathan had already made their way around the room to stand near him as well. When she reached him, Zed circled a comforting arm around Jebra's shoulders as he murmured words of reassurance, but his gaze was on Richard. 
Richard appreciated his grandfather watching out for him and keeping an eye on the witch woman just in case she had any ideas about pulling one of her tricks. Zed probably knew far better than any of them just what Chota was capable of. He also harbored a deep mistrust of the woman, not sharing at all Richard's view that Shota, at her core, was driven by the same convictions as they were. As much as he might appreciate her central purpose, Richard was well aware that Shota sometimes pursued that purpose in ways that had in the past caused him no end of grief. What she viewed as help sometimes ended up being nothing but trouble for him. He was all too aware that Shota also on occasion had her own agenda, such as when she had given the sword to Samuel. Richard suspected that she was up to something now as well. He just didn't know what or what was behind it. He wondered if it might have something to do with eliminating the other witch woman. Richard, Shota said in a soft, sympathetic tone, you have heard the nature of the terror that is descending upon us. You are the only one who can stop it. I don't know why it is so, but I do know that it is. Richard did not spare her for her gentle tone or her concern about their common enemy. You dare to express your deep distress over the suffering and death brought by the Order, and your conviction that only I can do something to stop the threat, and yet you conspired to withhold information just so that you could wrest the sword of truth from me? She didn't rise to the challenge. There was no conspiring, as you put it. It was a fair trade, value for value. Her voice remained serene. Besides, the sword would not be of any help to you in this, Richard. A poor excuse for you giving it to that murderous Samuel. Shota arched an eyebrow. And as it turns out, had I not, then those sisters of the dark who stole the boxes of Orden would probably have united by now. With all three boxes together, they very well might have already opened one, very well might have already unleashed the power of Orden, very well might have already turned us all over to the Keeper of the Dead. What good would the sword do you if the world of life were ended? It seems that Samuel, for whatever reason, has prevented a cataclysm. Samuel also used the sword to kidnap Rachel. In the process, he nearly killed Chase, and apparently intended to. Use your head, Richard. The sword served us all by buying us time, even if it was at a cost that none of us likes. What are you going to do with the time you now have that you otherwise would not? More to the point, what good would the sword do you now against the threat of the Order? Besides, with the sword anyone can be a seeker, a pretend seeker anyway. A true seeker does not need the sword to be the seeker. He knew that she was right. What would he do with the sword? Try to cut down the Imperial Order single-handedly? Just as Nietzsche had explained to Jebra how those with the gift could not overcome vast numbers just because they could wield magic, the same applied to the sword. Still, Shota had given the sword to Samuel, and now Samuel seemed to be acting on the orders of a different witch woman, one who apparently had no one's interest at heart but her own. Worse, what sense did it make to fret over a single weapon when so many were dying at the hands of the Order, when that single weapon would not preserve their lives or freedom. Richard knew that the sword was not the real weapon. The mind that directed it was what really mattered. He was the true seeker. He was the true weapon. Samuel couldn't take that. And yet, he had no idea what to do to stop the threat to halt any of the dangers closing in around them. Nietzsche stood not far away, distant enough to give Shota her chance to talk to him, but close enough to step between them in an instant if the talk turned to threats or to something Nietzsche didn't like. Richard stared into Nietzsche's blue eyes a moment before turning again to meet Shota's gaze. And just what is it that you expect me to do? Without being aware of her coming closer, he suddenly realized that he could feel Shota's breath against his cheek. 
It carried the faint scent of lavender. The fragrance felt as if it drew the tension right out of him. What I expect, Shota said in an intimate whisper as her arms slipped around his waist, is for you to understand, to truly understand. Distantly alarmed by what might be her veiled intent, Richard thought that he should back out of her firm embrace. Before he could move a muscle, Shota lifted his chin with a finger. In an instant, he was kneeling in the mud. The sound of the steady downpour roared around him, drumming on the roofs and awnings, pattering in the puddles, spattering mud on the walls of buildings, on broken carts, and on the legs of the milling mob. Soldiers in the distance shouted orders. Bony horses, their heads hanging, their legs caked with mud, looked miserable as they stood impassively in the rain. A group of soldiers off to the side laughed among themselves, while some others not far away chatted in trivial, bored conversation. Nearby wagons rumbled and bounced as they rolled slowly down a road, while in the distance a few dogs barked ceaselessly in a manner born of habit. In the gloomy light of the leaden overcast, everything looked a murky shade of grayish-brown. When he glanced to his right, Richard saw that there were other men lined up, kneeling in the mud beside him. Their drab, sodden clothes hung limp from slumped shoulders. Their faces were ashen, their eyes wild with fright. Behind them lurked the maw of a deep pit, looking like nothing so much as a dark opening into the underworld itself. With a growing sense of urgency, Richard tried to move, to shift his balance, so that he could scramble to his feet and defend himself. It was then that he realized his wrists were bound behind his back with what felt like leather thongs. When he tried to twist out of the tightly wound bindings, the leather cut deeper into his flesh. He ignored the searing pain and strained with all his might, but he could not break free. An old dread of being helpless with his hands tied welled up in him. All around him towered hulking soldiers, some in armor made of leather or out of rusty metal discs or chain mail, while still others wore nothing more protective than crude hide vests. Their weapons hung from wide belts and studded straps. None of the weapons were ornate. They were simple tools of their trade. Knives with homemade wooden handles riveted onto the heels of the blades, swords with leather wound around wooden grips to hold them to the tangs, maces made of crudely cast iron atop a stout hickory handle or wrought iron bar. Their coarse construction made them no less effective for their task. If anything, the lack of adornment served to emphasize their only purpose, and in so doing only made them look all the more sinister. The greasy hair of those who didn't shave their heads was matted by the steady rain. Some soldiers had multiple rings or sharpened metal posts in their ears and nose. The grime layering their faces appeared impervious to the rain. Many a man had a swath of a dark tattoo across his face. Some of the tattoos were almost like masks, while others swept over cheek and nose and brow in wild, snaking, dramatic designs. The bold tattoos made the men look all the less human, all the more savage. The eyes of the soldiers flickered back and forth, seldom pausing on any one thing, giving the men the look of restless animals. Richard had to blink the rainwater out of his eyes to see. He tossed his head, flicking strands of his wet hair back off his face. It was then that he saw men to his left as well, some weeping helplessly as soldiers held up those who would not or could not kneel upright in the sloppy mud. The sense of panic was palpable. The floodwaters of that panic spread to Richard, rising up through him, threatening to drown him. This wasn't real, he knew, but somehow it was. The rain was cold, his clothes were soaked, an occasional shiver rattled through him. The place stank worse than anything he could ever remember, a combination of acrid smoke, stale sweat, 
excrement, and putrefying flesh. The cries of those around him were all too real. He didn't think he would have been able to imagine Moan so devoid of hope and at the same time so desperately frightened. Many of the men trembled uncontrollably, and it wasn't from the cold rain. Richard realized, as he stared at them, that he was one of them, much the same as them. Just one of the many on their knees in the mud, one of many with their hands bound behind their backs. It was so impossible that it was disorienting. Somehow he was there. Somehow Shota had sent him to this place. He could not conceive of how such a thing could be possible. He had to be imagining it. A rock hidden beneath the mud dug painfully into his left knee. Such an unforeseeable, trivial detail seemed like it had to be real. How could he possibly imagine something so unexpected? He tried to shift his weight, but it was difficult to balance. He managed to push his knee to the side a little off the sharp rock. He couldn't be imagining such a thing. He began to wonder if it was everything else that he had actually been imagining. He wondered if it all had just been a dream, a diversion, a trick of his mind. He began to wonder if it could be possible that the chain fire spell had somehow made him forget what was really happening, or if reality was just so terrifying that he had somehow blocked it out of his mind withdrawing to an imaginary world, and now, suddenly, under the stress of the situation, he had snapped back to what was real. He began to realize that even if he didn't know exactly what was going on, or how he could be so confused, what really mattered was that this actually was real, and somehow he was only now awakening to it. In fact, that's just what it felt like to him, like he had just awakened, disoriented and confused. If he had been confused before, now he was desperately trying to remember, to understand how he had come to be where he found himself, how he had ended up on his knees in the mud among imperial soldiers. It seemed like he could almost remember how he had gotten there, almost recall it all, but it remained just out of reach, like a forgotten word that was lost somewhere in the dark well of the mind. Richard looked down the line to his left and saw a soldier grab a fistful of man's hair and yank his head upright. The man screamed, short, terror-choked sounds driven by a heaving chest. Richard could easily see that despite the man's frantic effort, he had no chance of escape. The sounds of his tearful pleas raised goosebumps on Richard's arms. The soldier behind the kneeling man brought a long, thin knife around in front of the man's exposed throat. Again, Richard tried to tell himself that he had been right before, that it wasn't real, that he was somehow just imagining it. But he could see the chip in the blade of the crudely honed knife see the man swallowing over and over in panting panic, see the grim grin on the soldier's smug face. When the knife sliced deep across the man's throat, Richard flinched in shock at the sight as the man flinched with the shock of pain. The man thrashed, but the soldier holding him by the hair had no trouble restraining his victim. The rain-slicked muscles of his powerful arm bulged as he exerted more effort to cut down through the man's throat a second time, far deeper and nearly all the way around. Blood, shockingly crimson in the gray light, gushed out with each beat of the man's still throbbing heart. Richard winced as the fresh smell of it made his nostrils flare. He tried to tell himself that it wasn't real. Yet, somehow, as he watched the man weakly twisting, watched as a bib of blood grew down the front of his shirt, soaked down the crotch of his pants, it was all too real. With one final effort, his neck gaping open, the man kicked his right leg out to the side. The soldier, still holding the man by the hair, heaved him back into the pit. Richard heard the dead weight splash down heavily in the bottom. Richard's heart pounded against his chest wall so hard 
that he thought it might burst. He felt sick. He thought he might vomit. He strained frantically to wrench his hands free, but the leather only cut deeper into his flesh. The rain was washing sweat into his eyes. The leather thongs had been in place for so long that just moving against them burned painfully enough into the raw wounds to bring fresh tears to his eyes. That didn't stop him, though. He grunted with effort, putting all his muscle into the struggle to break his bonds. He could feel the leather rasping against the exposed tendons in his wrist. And then Richard heard his name called out. He instantly recognized the voice. It was Caleb. His whole life hammered to a halt when he looked up, across the way, and into her dazzling green eyes. Every emotion he had ever had washed through him in an instant, leaving behind a kind of weak and terrible agony that ached all the way down to the marrow of his bones. He had been separated from her for so long. Seeing her, seeing every detail of her face, seeing the little arch in the wrinkle in her brow that he had forgotten about, seeing the exact way her back curved as she stood turned slightly, seeing the way her hair parted naturally under the weight of the rain, seeing her eyes, her beautiful green eyes, told him that he could not possibly be imagining it. Kalin stretched out an arm. Richard! The sound of her voice paralyzed him. It had been so long since he had heard her singular voice, a voice that from the first time he'd met her had riveted him with its intelligence, its clarity, its grace, its bewitching charm. But now there was none of that in her voice. All those qualities had been stripped away until all that was left was anguish beyond bearing. Matching the distress in her voice, Kalin's exquisite features twisted in horror at seeing him kneeling in the mud. Her eyes were rimmed with red. Tears streamed down her cheeks along with the rain. Richard felt frozen in terror, frozen at the sight of her, right there, so close yet so far, frozen to discover that she was there in the middle of thousands upon thousands of enemy troops. Richard! her arm desperately stretching for him again. She was trying to get to him, but she couldn't. She was being held back by a burly soldier with a shaved head. Richard noticed for the first time that the buttons on Kalin's shirt were gone, ripped off, so the shirt hung open, exposing her to the leers of the soldiers. But she didn't care. She only wanted Richard to see her, as if that was all that mattered in life, as if that single sight of him was her whole life, as if she needed only that to live. A painful knot swelled in his throat. Tears welled up. Richard whispered her name, too shocked by the sight of her to bring forth more. Frantic, Kalin again reached for him, straining against the restraint of the soldier's meaty hand. His tight grip left white prints of his fingers in the flesh of her arm. Richard, Richard, I love you. Dear spirits, I love you. As she tried to tear away, to lunge toward him, a soldier circled a powerful arm around her middle, inside her open shirt, holding her back. The man reached around and with a finger and thumb seized Kalin's nipple, twisting it as he glanced up, grinning with meaning, making sure that Richard saw what he was doing. A small cry of surprised pain escaped Kalin's throat, but otherwise she ignored the soldier, instead screaming Richard's name in abject terror. Fired by rage, Richard furiously tried to get to his feet. He had to get to her. The soldier laughed as he watched Richard struggle. There was no way another chance would come along. This was it. This would be his only chance. As he began to force his way to his feet, a guard rammed a boot into Richard's gut so hard that it doubled him over. Another soldier kicked him in the side of the head for good measure, stunning him nearly senseless. The world dimmed. Sound melted together into a dull drone. Richard struggled to remain conscious. He didn't want to lose sight of Kalin. 
there was no sight in the whole world that meant more to him than the sight of her. He had to find a way to get her out of the middle of this nightmare. As he fought to regain his breath, the big hand of a soldier seized his hair and yanked him upright. Richard gasped, trying to draw a breath against the stupefying pain of the blows. He felt warm blood running down the side of his face, washing cold mud down his neck. As his head was pulled upright, Richard's gaze fell on Kaylin again, on her long hair now tangled and matted by the rain. Her green eyes were so beautiful that he thought his heart might burst with the pain of seeing her again, but not being able to hold her in his arms. He wanted so badly to hold her in his arms, to comfort her, to protect her. Instead, another man was holding her in his arms. She tried to squirm away. He cupped her breast, squeezing until Richard could see that it was hurting her. She beat at him with her fists, but he held her fast. He laughed at her futile efforts as his gaze again slid to Richard. Kalen fought him, but at the same time ignored what he was doing, ignored the distraction. What he was doing was not what mattered most to her. Richard was what mattered most. Her arms frantically stretched out toward him. Richard, I love you. I've missed you so much. She was overcome with sobs of sheer misery. Dear spirits, help him. Please, somebody help him. To his left, the next man in line tried with all his might to back away as his throat was sliced deep. Richard could hear the man's frantic gasps gurgling through the gash that opened up his windpipe. Richard felt faint with panic. He didn't know what to do. Magic. He should call his gift. But how was he to do that? He didn't know how to call forth magic. And yet in the past he had been able to do it. Rage. In the past, his gift had always worked through his anger. Seeing the soldier holding Kalen, hurting her, provided him with more than enough anger. Seeing another of those monsters come in close to her, leering down at her, touching her intimately, only fanned the wild flames of his anger. His world went red with rage. With every fiber of his being, Richard tried to ignite his gift with the essence of that fury. He clenched his jaw, gritted his teeth with the monumental concentration of his wrath. He shook with rage, expecting an explosion of power to match that rage. He saw what he needed to do. It seemed so close. He imagined it cutting down the soldiers. He held his breath against the storm that was about to be unleashed. It felt like falling unexpectedly without any ground below him to catch his fall. The rain continued to plunge from the gray sky as if to drown his effort. No magic arced through the empty space between Richard and the man who held Kalen. No conjured lightning erupted. No justice was at hand. In all his life, if there was anything there, this was the moment it would have come. That much he knew beyond any doubt. There could be no more urgent need, no more desire, no more wrath for the woman he loved. But no power was there, no redemption at hand. He might as well have been born without the gift. He had no gift. It was gone. It felt to Richard as if the world was caving in around him. He wanted everything to slow down, to give him time to find a solution but everything swirled in a terrible rush. It was all happening too fast. It was so unfair to have to die like this. He hadn't had a chance to live, to have a life with Kalen. He loved her so much, and he hadn't really been able to be with her, just the two of them, living in peace. He wanted to smile and laugh with her, to hold her, to go through life with her, just to sit in front of a fire with her on a cold, snowy night, holding her close to him, safe and warm, as they talked about the things that mattered to them, about their future. They should have a future. It was so unfair. He wanted to live his life. 
Instead, it was to end in this miserable place for no good reason, for nothing. He wasn't even able to make his death mean something, to die fighting for life. Instead, he was going to die here in the rain and mud, surrounded by men who hated all that was good in life, while Kalin was forced to watch it happen. He didn't want her to see this. He knew that she would never be able to get the sight of it out of her mind. He didn't want to leave her with that last horrific memory of him struggling in the bloody throes of death. He made another attempt to get up, as did most of the other men. The soldier behind him stepped on his calves, bearing down with all his weight. The pain felt distant. Richard was in a daze. He wanted nothing in the world so much as to get Kalin away from the men who were holding her, groping her. Kalin screamed in rage at them, clawed at them, swung her fists at them, and at the same time cried in helpless terror for Richard. He twisted with all his might against the leather thongs binding his wrists, but rather than part, they only cut deeper. He felt like an animal caught in a trap. His hands had gone numb. He could no longer feel the warm blood dripping off his fingertips. He didn't want to die. What was he to do? He had to stop this. Somehow he had to, but he didn't know how. In the past, anger was the means to reach his gift, to call forth its power. Now there was nothing but a helpless confusion. Kalen! He couldn't seem to help himself from being swept up in the terror of it, in the blind panic of it. He couldn't stop the headlong rush of it, couldn't regain his sense of control over himself. He was being swept away in a river of events he could not control or stop. It was all so senseless. It was all so overwhelmingly pointless, so monumentally brutal. Kalen! Richard! She cried as she again reached out for him. Richard, I love you more than life. I love you so much. You're everything to me. You always have been. Sobs caught her breath, turning them to gasps. Richard, I need you so badly. His heart was breaking. He felt that he was failing her. A soldier seized Richard by the hair. No, Kalin screamed, holding out a hand. No, please no. Somebody please help him. Dear spirit, somebody please. The soldier leaned down, a cruel smile twisting his grime-streaked face. Don't worry. I'll see to her personally he laughed in Richard's ear. Please, Richard heard himself say. Please, no. Dear spirit, please, somebody help him, Kalin cried to those around her. She could do nothing, and she knew it. There was no chance for him, and she knew it. She was reduced to begging for a miracle. That in itself fed the flames of hot dread burning out of control within him. This was the end of everything. She's a real looker, the soldier said as he leered across the way at Kalin, proving what Richard knew, that no miracle was at hand. Please, leave her be. The soldier behind him laughed. That was what he had wanted to hear. Richard was choking on the sob, welling up in his throat. He couldn't breathe past it. Tears ran down his face along with the rain. She was the only woman he had ever loved, the only person who meant everything to him, meant more than life itself to him. Without Kalin, there was no life. There was only existence. She was his world. Without Kalin, life was empty. Without him, he knew Kalin's life would be just as empty. He saw other women not far from Kalin, all being held by soldiers, all screaming for their men. He saw them saying things much like the things Kalin was saying, offering the same words of love, the same calls for someone to save them. The soldiers taunted the men kneeling in the mud with vile oaths. 
Seeing the women in the hands of the soldiers, one of the kneeling men to Richard's right struggled hard enough to earn himself a lightning-quick stab to the gut. It didn't kill him, but it was enough to keep him from fighting while he was made to wait his turn. As he knelt stiff and still, his wide eyes stared down at his own pink, glistening insides slowly bulging out of the gash. The screams of the man's wife seemed like they could have split the clouds above. The man immediately to Richard's left gasped his last breath, thrashing in uncoordinated movements as the soldier holding up the man's head sawed the large knife back and forth across the victim's exposed throat. When finished, the soldier growled with the effort of heaving the dead weight back into the open pit. Richard heard the body thud down in the bottom of the open grave atop other bodies. He could hear gurgling gasps coming from the dark hole. Your turn, the soldier holding Richard said as he stepped around behind him to assume the role of executioner. The man leaned close. His breath stank of ale and sausage. I need to finish this. I've a meeting with your lovely wife as soon as I'm done with you. Kaylin, isn't it? Yes, that's right. One of the other women confessed that your wife's name was Kaylin. Don't you worry, lad. I won't give Kaylin much of a chance to grieve reminiscing about you. I'll have her full attention, I can promise you that. After I've had my satisfaction from her, others will have their turn on her. Richard wanted to break the man's neck. Think about that as your wicked soul slides into the dark eternal agony of the underworld, as you fall into the cold, merciless grasp of the Keeper. That's where all your kind goes, to the justice of eternal suffering, and that's as it should be, seeing as how we've all sacrificed everything to come up here to this forsaken land so we can bring divine light and the law of the order to all you selfish heathens. Your sinful way of life your mere existence offends the Creator, and it offends those of us who bow to him. The man was working himself up into a righteous rage. Do you have any idea what I've sacrificed for the salvation of the souls of your people? My family went hungry, went without, sacrificed, so that they could send everything to our courageous troops. My brother and I gave ourselves over to the fight for our cause, and everything we believe in. We both came north to do our duty to our emperor and our creator. We both devoted our lives to the cause of bringing goodness to you people. We fought in countless bloody battles against those who resist our efforts on behalf of what is right and just. We saw countless of our brethren die in those battles. I saw the glory of our army of the order continue on in the fight for salvation while your people sent the wicked gifted against us. Those gifted conjured evil made of magic. My brother was blinded by some of that magic. He screamed in agony as that magic bloodied his eyes and burned his lungs. The infections that swiftly befell him made his whole head swell his sightless eyes bulge. He could only moan in agony. We left him to die alone so that we could move on in our noble struggle, as was only right. Your wife and those like her will now sacrifice themselves to give us a small diversion in this miserable life as we labor in that noble struggle. It's her small payment on a debt of gratitude for what we have given over for our fellow man in order to bring the word of the order to those who would otherwise turn away from their duty to faith. Someday, your sinful wife will join you there in the darkness of the underworld, but not until after we're finished with her. Just don't expect her to be joining you any time soon, as I expect she'll be whoring for the brave soldiers of the Order for some time to come, what with how the men like to get their hands on a good-looking woman like her in order to take their minds off the drudgery of their honourable work. I expect she'll be kept good and busy, since there is so much honourable work to do. He waggled his knife before Richard's eyes. Like this business here. With the relief us men get from her, 
We'll have the strength to redouble our determination to eliminate all those who will not submit to the ways of the order. It was insanity. Richard could hardly believe that there were men this irrational, this devoted to such mindless beliefs, but there were. They seemed to emerge everywhere, multiplying like maggots, devoted to destroying anything joyful and beneficial to life. He choked back his words, his rage. Nothing angered men like this as much as reason or truth or life or goodness. Such qualities only incited such men to destroy. Because Richard knew that anything he said would only provoke the man and make it worse for Kalin, he kept quiet. That was all he could do for her now. Seeing that he had not goaded Richard into an appeal, the soldier laughed again, and threw a kiss toward Kalin. Be with you shortly, love, soon as I'm done divorcing you from your worthless husband here. He was a monster, shortly to be headed for the woman Richard loved, toward a defenseless, terrified woman who was only beginning to suffer at the hands of these brutes. Monster. Could this be what Shota had meant? The witch woman had once said that if Richard and Kalin ever married and lay together, she would conceive a monster. They had always assumed that Chota had meant that if they conceived a child, then their child would be a monster because that child would have Richard's gift and Kalin's confessor power. But maybe that was not at all the real meaning behind Chota's foretelling. After all, nothing Chota warned them about ever turned out the way she had made it seem, even the way she herself believed. Shota's warnings and predictions always seemed to come about in a completely unforeseen manner, in a way that they had never even imagined. But at the same time, Shota's predictions had always turned out to be true. Was this what Shota's prediction had really meant? Was this the complex set of events finally reaching the climax of her prophecy? Shota had warned them emphatically not to marry, or Kalin would bear a monster child. They had married. Could this be how Shota's prophecy unfolded? Could this have all along been the real meaning behind her warning? Were these monsters to sire a monster? Richard was choking on his tears. His death would not be the worst of it. Kalin would suffer the worst of it, suffer a living death at the hands of those brutes, mother their monster. Richard, you know I love you. That's all that matters, Richard, that I love you. Kalen, I love you too. He couldn't think of anything more to say, anything more meaningful. He guessed that there was nothing more meaningful, nothing more important to him. Those simple words spoke a whole life's worth of meaning, a whole universe of meaning. I know, my love, she said with a brief spark of a smile that flashed for an instant in her beautiful eyes. I know. Richard saw a blade sweep around before his face. He instinctively backed away. The man straddling his legs was ready and jammed a knee between Richard's shoulder blades, stopping him from falling back then pulled his head up by his hair. Kalin, seeing what was happening, screamed again, flailing at the men holding her. Don't pay any attention to them, Richard. Just look at me. Richard, look at me. Think about me. Think of how much I love you. Richard knew what she was doing. Remember the day we were married? I remember it now, Richard. I remember it always. She was trying to give him the last gift of a pleasant, loving thought. I remember the day you asked me to be your wife. I love you, Richard. Remember our wedding? Remember the spirit house? She was also trying to distract him, to keep him from thinking about what was happening. Instead, it only reminded him of Shota's warning that if he married her, she would conceive a monster. Touching, the soldier behind him said. It's the passionate ones like her who are good in the sack, don't you think? 
Richard wanted to rip the man's head off, but he said nothing. The man wanted him to say something, to beg, to protest, to wail in agony. As a last act of defiance against such men, Richard denied him the satisfaction. Kaylin cried out her love, and that she wanted him to remember the first time she had kissed him. Despite everything, that made him smile. At the moment, she didn't care what was going to happen to her. She just wanted to distract him, to ease the pain and terror of his last moments of life. His last moments. It was all ending. It was all over. There was no more. Life was over. His time with the woman he loved was over. There would be no more. The world was ending. Richard! Richard, I love you so much! Look at me, Richard. I love you. Look at me. That's right, look at me. You're the only one I ever loved. Only you, Richard. Only you. That's all that matters. That I love you. Do you love me? Tell me, please, Richard, tell me. Tell me now. He felt the blade catch on the thin veneer of flesh covering his throat. I love you, Kalen. You alone. Always. Touching, the soldier growled in his ear as he held the blade against Richard's throat. While you're down in the pit, bleeding out, I'll have my hands all over her. I'm going to rape your pretty little wife. You'll be dead by then, but before you die, I want you to know exactly what I'm going to do to her, and that there's nothing you can do to stop it, because it's the Creator's will being done. You should have long ago bowed to the ways of the Order, but instead you fought to keep to your sinful ways, your selfish ways, and turned away from everything right and just. For your crimes against your fellow man, you will not only die but you will suffer for all eternity at the hands of the keeper of the underworld. Suffer greatly. As you go to the dark afterlife, I want you to go there knowing that if your precious Kalen lives, it will only be as a whore for us. If she lives long enough, and she has a boy child, he will grow up to be a great soldier of the order and to hate your kind. We'll see to it that he comes here some day to spit on your grave to spit on you and those like you who would have raised him in your wicked ways, raised him to turn away from serving his fellow man and the Creator. You think on that as your spirit is being sucked down into darkness. As your body grows cold, I'll be with the nice warm body of your love, giving it to her good. I want to make sure you know that before you die. Richard was already dead inside. It was over. Life and the world were ended. So much lost. Everything lost. For nothing but a mindless hatred of every value, of life itself, by those who chose instead to embrace the emptiness of death. I love you now and always, with all my heart, he said in a hoarse voice. You've made my life a joy. He saw Kalen nodding that she'd heard him and her lips mouthing her love for him. She was so beautiful. More than anything, he hated to see her inconsolable grief. They stared into one another's eyes, frozen in that instant that would be the last instant that the world existed. Richard gasped in a cry of terror, anguish, and sudden sharp pain as he felt the blade bite flesh, felt it slice mortally deep into his throat. It was the end of everything. Chapter 18 Stop it, Nietzsche growled. Richard blinked. His mind reeled in confusion. Nietzsche had Shota's wrist in an iron grip, holding her hand away from him. But Shota still had an arm around his waist. I don't know what you're doing, Nietzsche said in a tone so dangerous he thought that surely Shota would shrink back in fear. But you will stop it. Shota did not shrink back, nor did she look the least bit fearful. I am doing what needs to be done. Nietzsche was having none of it. 
Back away from him, or I will kill you where you stand. Kara, a jeal in hand, and looking even more displeased than Nietzsche, stood close on the other side of the witch woman, blocking her in. Before Shota could return the threat in kind, Richard collapsed heavily to the marble bench surrounding the fountain. He was panting, gasping, and in a state of ragged terror. In his mind's eye, he could still see Kalin in the hands of those thugs, still feel the sharp blade slicing deep into him. His fingers lightly brushed across his throat, but there was no gaping wound, no blood. He desperately didn't want to let go of the sight of Kalin, but at the same time it was so horrifying a glimpse of her hopeless dread that he wanted nothing so much as to forever wipe it from his mind. He wasn't completely sure where he was. He wasn't sure exactly what was happening. It wasn't at all clear to him what was real and what wasn't. He wondered if he was on the cusp of death and this was some confusing death dream before all his life blood drained out of him, some final delusion to torture his mind as he passed from existence. He groped, trying to feel for other bodies there with him in the pit. While Kara stood protectively before him, shielding him from the witch woman, Nietzsche immediately abandoned her altercation with Shota to sit beside him. She circled an arm around his shoulders. Richard, are you all right? She leaned down, looking into his eyes. You look like you've seen the walking dead. Ignoring Kara, Shota folded her arms as she stood over them, watching Richard. In his mind, the sound of Kalin's screams still echoed. The sight of her as she cried out his name still tore at his heart. It had been so long since he had seen her. To see her again so suddenly and like that was devastating. Richard, it's all right, Nietzsche said. You're right here with me, with all of us. Richard pressed a hand to his forehead. How long was I gone? Nietzsche's brow twitched. Gone. I think Shota did something. How long was she doing whatever she did? I didn't let her do anything. I stopped her before she could begin. The instant she touched you under your chin, I stopped her. She didn't have enough time to do anything. Richard could still see Kalin in his mind's eye, still see her screaming for him, as the grimy hands of Imperial Order soldiers held her back. He ran his trembling fingers back through his hair. She had enough time. I'm so sorry, Nietzsche whispered. I thought I stopped her soon enough. He didn't think he could go on. He didn't think he could summon the strength to draw another breath. He didn't think that he would ever again be able to do anything but abandon himself to despair. He could not hold back his anguish, his pain, his tears. Nietzsche drew his face against her shoulder, wordlessly sheltering him in the refuge of her embrace. It all seemed so futile. It was all ending. It was all over. He'd always said that they didn't have a chance to defeat Jagang's army. The order was too powerful. They were going to win the war. There was nothing Richard could do about it, nothing left to live for but waiting for the horror of death to catch them all. Shota stepped up on the side of him, beside where he sat on the short marble wall, opposite Nietzsche, and started to lay a hand on his shoulder. Kara snatched the witch woman's wrist, stopping her. I'm sorry to have to do that, Richard, Shota said, ignoring the moored Sith. But you need to see, to understand... To shut up, Nietzsche said, and keep your hands off him. Don't you think you've brought him enough pain? Does everything you do have to be injurious? Can't you ever help him without trying to hurt him or cause him trouble at the same time? As Shota withdrew her hand, Nietzsche cupped hers to his face and with a thumb wiped a tear from his cheek. Richard. He nodded at her tender concern, unable to summon his voice. He could still see Kalin crying out for him as she tried to fight off the hands of those men. 
As long as he lived, he would be haunted by that sight. At that moment, he wanted more than anything to spare her the pain of seeing him executed and of her being in the cruel clutches of the order. He wanted to go back, to do something, to save her from such inhuman abuse. He couldn't bear her world ending as she saw him murdered like that. But it wasn't real. He couldn't have been there like that. Such a thing was impossible. He could only have imagined it. Relief began to seep into him. It wasn't real. It wasn't. Kalen wasn't in the hands of the Order. She wasn't seeing him being executed. It was just a cruel trick by the witch woman, just another of her illusions. Except it had been real for all those people in Galia, as well as untold other places where the Order had been. Even if it hadn't been real for Richard, it had been all too real for them. That was what it had been like. Their worlds had ended in just that manner. He knew exactly what they had suffered. He knew exactly what it felt like. How many countless unknown, unnamed good people had lost their chance at life in just that way, all for the otherworldly ambitions of those from the old world. A new dread suddenly overwhelmed him. He had the gift. He was a war wizard. For most of those with the gift, it manifested itself in one specific area. But being a war wizard meant that he had elements of all the various aspects of the gift, and one aspect of magic was prophecy. What if what he had seen was really a prophecy? What if that was what was to happen? What if what he had seen was really a vision of the future? But he didn't believe that the future was fixed. While some things, such as death, were inevitable... That didn't mean that everything was fixed or that one couldn't work toward worthy goals in life, couldn't avert disasters, couldn't alter the course of events. If it was a prophecy, it only meant that he had seen what was possible. It didn't mean that he couldn't try to stop it from happening. After all, Shota's prophecies never seemed to come out the way she presented them. And anyway, what he had seen, what he had just experienced, was most likely Shota's doing. Richard squeezed Nietzsche's hand in silent appreciation. Her other hand on his shoulders returned the squeeze. Her concern melted a little under the warmth of a small smile of relief at seeing him recovering his wits. Richard rose up before Shota in a way that by all rights should have made her take a step back. She stood her ground. How dare you do that to me? How dare you send me to that place? I did not send you anywhere, Richard. Your own mind took you where it would. I did nothing but release the thoughts you had suppressed. I spared you what would have otherwise come out in nightmares. I don't remember my dreams. Shota nodded as she studied his eyes. This one you would have remembered. It would have been far worse than what you have just suffered. It is better to face such visions when you can confront them for what they are, and grasp what truth they contain. Richard could feel the blood heating his face. Is that what you meant before? When you said that if I married Kalen, she would bear a monster? Is that the real meaning hidden in your convoluted prophecy? Shota showed no emotion. It means what it means. Richard could still hear the words of the Imperial Order soldier telling him what he was going to do to Kalin, telling him how she was going to be treated, telling him how she would give birth to children who would grow up to spit on the graves of those who had wanted to live their own lives for themselves, those who believed in everything he held dear. Richard abruptly lunged for Shota, and in an instant had her by the throat. The collision and his fierce determination to take her down carried them both over the short wall and into the fountain. With Richard on top, grappling her, their momentum drove them both under the water. Richard hauled her up by her throat. Is that what you meant? Water streamed from her face. She coughed it out. He shook her. Is that what you meant? Richard blinked. 
He was standing. He was dry. Shota stood before him. She was dry. His hands were still at his sides. Get a hold of yourself, Richard, Shota arched an eyebrow. You are still partly in your dreams. Richard looked around. It was true. He wasn't wet, and neither was Shota. Not one wavy auburn hair on her head was out of place. Nietzsche's brow twitched when he glanced over at her. She looked puzzled by what could be the cause of his confusion. It must be true. He was still dreaming. It really was just a dream, just like his execution, just like seeing Kalin. He'd only imagined that he had Shota by the throat. But he wanted to. Was that what you meant when you said that Kalin would bear a monster child? Richard asked, a little more quietly, but with no less menace. I don't know who this Kalin is. Richard's jaw flexed as he gritted his teeth, thinking of having her by the throat for real. Answer the question. Is it? Shota lifted a cautionary finger. Believe me, Richard, you really don't want a witch angry with you. And you don't want me angry with you, so answer me. Is that what you meant? She smoothed the sleeves of her dress as she chose her words carefully. In the first place, I have revealed to you at different times, in the various things that I've told you, what I see of the flow of events in time. I don't remember this woman, Kalen, nor do I remember anything having to do with her so I don't know what event or prediction you are talking about, as I don't remember it either. Shota's face took on the kind of darkly dangerous look that reminded him that he was talking to a witch woman whose very name inspired terrified trembling among most of the people of the Midlands. But you are venturing into serious matters of grave peril in that flow of events forward in time. Her brow drew down in displeasure. What precisely do you mean about a monster child? Richard turned to gaze into the still waters of the fountain as he thought about the terrible things he'd seen. He couldn't bear to say it aloud, couldn't bear to say it in front of others, to even suggest aloud that Shota had once made a prediction that he feared might actually mean that Kalin would conceive a child fathered by the monsters of the Imperial Order. It felt to him as if saying it out loud might somehow make it true. It was so painful an idea that he pushed the whole notion aside and decided instead to ask another question. He turned back to her. What does it mean that I couldn't call my gift through anger? Shota sighed heavily. Richard, you must understand something. I did not give you a vision. I did nothing more than help you to release hidden thoughts that were your own. I did not give you a dream of my making, nor did I plant any ideas in your mind. I merely made you aware of your own intellection. I can't tell you anything about what you saw, because I don't know what you saw. Then why would you... I only know that you are the one who must stop the order. I helped you bring your own suppressed thoughts to the surface in order to help you to better understand. Understand what? What you must understand. I no more know what that is than I know what you saw within your own mind that so upset you. You might say that I am merely the messenger. I have not read the message. But you made me see things that... No, I did not. I opened the curtain for you, Richard. I did not make the rain you saw out of that window. You are trying to blame me for the rain instead of appreciating the fact that I did nothing but open the curtain so that you could see it with your own eyes. Richard glanced over at Nietzsche. She said nothing. He looked up the steps at his grandfather, standing with his hands loosely clasped, silently watching, Zed had always taught him to deal with the reality of the way the world was, taught him not to rail at what some believed was the invisible hand of fate controlling and conjuring events. 
Was he doing that to Shota? Was he trying to blame her for revealing things that he hadn't seen or hadn't been willing to see? I'm sorry, Shota, he said in a quieter voice. You're right. You did indeed show me the rain. I don't have a clue as to what to do about it, but I saw it. I shouldn't blame you for what others are doing. I'm sorry. Shota smiled in a small way. That is part of the reason why you are the one, Richard, the only one who can stop the madness. You are willing to see the truth. That is why I brought Jebra with such terrible accounts of what is happening at the hands of the Order. You need to know the truth of it. Richard nodded, only feeling worse, feeling even more despairing over not having any idea of how to do what she thought he could. He met Shota's unflinching gaze. You've made a great effort to bring Jebra here. You've come a very long way. Your future, your very life, depends on this no less than does my life or the lives of all free people, all those with the gift. If the order wins, we all die, including you. Isn't there anything you can tell me that will help me to do something to stop this madness? I could use any help you can give me. Isn't there anything you can tell me? She stared at him a moment before speaking, stared as if her mind were in other places. Whenever I bring you information, she said at last, it angers you, as if I were the one creating what is, rather than merely reporting it. We're all facing slavery, torture, and death, and you're suddenly miffed about getting your feelings hurt? In spite of herself, Chota smiled at his characterization. You think that I simply pluck revelations out of the air as if I were picking a pear. The smile faded as her gaze focused off into the distance. You could not begin to understand the personal cost of bringing forth such shrouded knowledge. I do not wish to undertake such a formidable task if that dearly gained knowledge is going to do nothing but feed a grudge. Richard shoved his hands in his back pockets. All right, I get your point. If you're going to make such an effort, you expect me to consider it earnestly. We all have everything at stake, Shota. I'd value whatever you can tell me. While Richard did honestly believe that Shota was telling him what she saw of the flow of events in time, he didn't believe that the meaning of such tellings was necessarily straightforward or what Shota believed they meant. Still, she had always offered him information that in some way had been central to the issues at hand, chain fire being only the latest. While her revelation of the word chain fire had been without an explanation that would help him, that clue alone had sustained his effort to find the answer to what had happened to Kalin. Without that single word, he would never have recognized that particular book as the one holding the key to discovering the truth. Shota took a deep breath, finally letting it out in resignation. She leaned toward him the slightest bit, as if to emphasize how serious she was. It is for your ears alone. Chapter 19 Richard glanced at Kara and Nietzsche. By their expressions, there was no doubt in his mind as to what they thought of the very idea of leaving him without their protection. While he knew they were convinced of the necessity of their being close at hand, he didn't really believe that he would be any safer for their watchful guard a step away rather than a few dozen. After all, Shota had just demonstrated as much. It was obvious, though, that they didn't share such a view. Richard thought that maybe he could find a solution that would satisfy everyone. They're on the same side. What difference? The difference is that it is my wish. Shota turned to the fountain, turning her back on him and folding her arms. If you want to hear what I have to say, then you will honor my wishes. Richard didn't know if she was merely being obstinate or not, but he did know that this was not the time to test the point. If he was going to get any help from Shota, 
he needed to show her his trust. Likewise, Nietzsche and Kara were just going to have to trust him. He gestured toward the steps. Please, both of you, go up there with Zed and wait. Nietzsche clearly didn't like the idea any more than did Kara, but she recognized by the look he gave her that he needed her to do as he asked. She shot the back of Shota's head a hot glare. If for any reason I believe you are about to harm him, I will reduce you to a charred cinder before you have a chance to act. Why would I harm him? Shota looked back over her shoulder. Richard is the only one who has a chance to stop the order. Exactly. Richard watched as Nietzsche and Kara wordlessly turned and ascended the steps. He had expected more of an argument from Kara, but was glad not to have it. He shared a long look with his grandfather. Zed seemed to be uncharacteristically quiet. For that matter, so did Nathan and Anne. All three watched him as if studying a curiosity found under a rock. Zed gave Richard a slight nod, urging him to go on, to do what needed doing. Richard heard the fountain behind him abruptly start to flow again. When he turned back, he saw the waters shooting up into the air at the pinnacle, falling back, and streaming from the points of the bowls to dance at last in the lower pool. Shota sat on the short marble wall surrounding the pool, her back to him as she leisurely trailed the fingers of one hand through the water. Something about her body language made the hair at the back of Richard's neck stand on end. When she turned to look back over her shoulder, Richard found himself looking into the face of his mother. His muscles locked stiff. Richard. Her sad smile showed how much she loved and missed him. She didn't look to have aged a day from his last boyhood memory of her. As Richard stood frozen in place, she rose fluidly before him. Oh, Richard, she said in a voice as clear and liquid as the waters of the fountain, how I've missed you. She slipped one arm around his waist as she ran the fingers of her other hand tenderly through his hair. She gazed longingly into his eyes. How I've missed you so very much. Richard immediately choked off his emotions. He knew better than to be lulled into believing it was really his mother. The first time he'd met Shota, she had appeared to him as his mother, who had died in a fire when Richard had been but a boy. At the time, Richard had wanted to take Shota's head off with his sword for what he interpreted as a cruel ruse. Shota had read the thought and reproached him for it, saying that appearing as she had was an innocent gift of a living memory of his love for his mother and her undying love for him. Shota had said that the kindness had been at a cost to herself that he would never be able to understand or appreciate. Richard didn't think that this time she was giving him a gift. He didn't know what she was doing or why, but he decided to confront it calmly and without jumping to conclusions. Shota, I thank you for the beautiful memory, but why is it necessary to appear as my mother? Shota's brow, in the likeness of his mother's, wrinkled in thought. Do you know the name Baracus? The hairs at the back of Richard's neck that had only just begun to settle again stiffened. He gently placed his hands on her waist, and with great care backed her away. There was a man named Baracus who was first wizard back in the time of the Great War. With one finger, Richard lifted the amulet hanging at his chest. This was his. His mother nodded. He is the one. He is a great war wizard. That's right. Like you. Richard felt himself blush at the idea of his mother calling him great, even if it was Shota in her guise. He knew how to use his ability. I don't. His mother nodded again, a slight smile curling the corners of her mouth just as he remembered. His mother had smiled that way when she'd been proud that he had grasped the point of a particularly difficult lesson. He wondered if Shota meant that memory to have meaning. Do you know what happened to him? to Baracus. 
Richard took a settling breath. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. There was trouble with the Temple of the Winds. The Temple and its invaluable contents had been sent to the safety of another world. The Underworld, she amended. Yes, Baracus went there to try to fix the trouble. His mother smiled as she again ran her fingers through his hair. Just as you did, I suppose. When she finally finished fussing with his hair, her beautiful eyes turned down, her gaze settling again on his. He went there for you. For me? Richard looked at her askance. What are you talking about? Subtractive magic had been locked away in the temple, in the underworld, withdrawn from the world of life so that no wizard would again be born with it. Richard didn't know if she was merely repeating what he had learned or if she was giving him what she believed to be the facts. From the accounts of the time that I've studied, that's what I've come to suspect. As a consequence, people were no longer born with the subtractive side of the gift. She watched him with a kind of calm seriousness that he found disturbing in the extreme. But you were she finally said in a way that carried great meaning concealed in simplicity. Richard blinked. Are you saying that he did something while he was at the Temple of the Winds so that someone would again be born with subtractive magic? By someone? I presume that you mean you? She arched an eyebrow as if to underscore the sobriety of the question. What are you suggesting? None has been born with subtractive magic, and more born a war wizard since then, since the temple was sent from this world. Look, I don't know for sure if that's true, but even if it is, that doesn't mean... Do you know what war wizard Baracus did upon his return from the Temple of the Winds? Richard was taken aback by the question, wondering what relevance it could have. Well, yes... When he returned from the Temple of the Winds, he committed suicide. Richard gestured weakly to the vast complex above them. He threw himself off the side of the wizard's keep, off the outer wall overlooking the valley and the city of Adendril. His mother nodded sorrowfully, overlooking the place where the Confessor's Palace would eventually be built. I suppose so. But first, before he threw himself off that wall, he left something for you. Richard stared down at her, not completely sure that he'd heard her correctly. For me? Are you sure? His mother nodded. The account you read was not privy to everything. You see, when he returned from the Temple of the Winds, before he threw himself from the side of the keep, he gave his wife a book and sent her with it to his library. His library? Baracus had a secret library. Richard felt like he was tiptoeing across fresh ice. I didn't even know he had a wife. But Richard, you know her. His mother smiled in a way that made the already stiff hair at the back of his neck stand out even more. Richard could hardly breathe. I know her? How is that possible? Well, his mother said with a one-shouldered shrug, you know of her. Do you know the wizard who created the first confessor? Yes, Richard said, confused by her change of subject. His name was Merit. The first confessor was a woman named Magda Cirrus. There is a painting of them across the ceiling down in the confessor's palace.